This week's episode of This Is Only A Test is made possible with support from Evident. Evident is revolutionizing the way personal data is shared. Their simple, secure platform lets businesses confidently know who they're dealing with without handling sensitive personal data. With connections to thousands of authoritative sources through a single API, Evident is the only platform that enables comprehensive, accurate, and up-to-date identity and credential verifications. Check out evidentid.com slash test to sign up today and to get started. That's evidentid.com slash test. Now on with the show. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, September 5th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only A Test, the official podcast of tested.com. everyone and welcome to a fantastic episode this week. I've called it already, judging by everything I know we're going to talk about from our show notes, it's going to be a good one. Thanks for joining us. I'm Norm and with me is our our main crew. We've got Jeremy Williams. Hi Norman Chan. How you doing? Good. Good. I'm excited to talk about all the things that you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy's been knee dipping pinball mm-hmm. this week of course and Learning C++, Norman Chan. Oh, I can't wait to hear about that. <laughs> it's going to be so riveting. No, how about Kishore Hari? Hello. Oh, welcome back. This is one of the best weeks I've had in a long time. New Tool album, first time in 13 years. <laughs> oh, gosh, it's a Kishore episode. And all the cosplay and science I could stuff into 72 hours. Oh, so uh, you got to be talking about Dragon Con. That's, that's, that's what you're talking about, right? Oh, yeah. I'm just back. I am not recovered. One iota, but yep. I'm here to talk about it. It's going to be our top story, but before we get to that, how's everyone doing? Jeremy, anything fun this weekend? It was Labor Day weekend, guys. I know you were in Atlanta, but Jeremy, anything? It was a long weekend. Yeah, yeah. My kids had the four days. Like, they had the Friday through Monday off from what? school. Yeah, like, we they only been in school for two weeks. And the school system was like, Lazy. too much. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Give them some time off. Wow. Uh, so it was fine, you know, a little impromptu visit to see the Grands out in the mountains. Uh, we had a good time. Yeah, it was a perfect Labor Day weekend. Nice. How, was, how was yours? I, what did I do? I stayed home and watched a bunch of movies, television. I did go to Sausalito. Yeah, I, I dro- uh, yeah, it's impromptu trip on Labor Day. Drove, that's a city to the north of San Francisco. It was very cold and foggy in San Francisco. So I decided to go, if you go 20 miles any direction, North, east, south, it yep. gets sunnier. So mm-hmm. we went to Sausalito, right across the Golden Gate Bridge. It's where the very first tested office was located. So I drove by there. It's now, I believe, a law firm. So that's exciting. I forgot about that. Yeah. I don't, did you guys ever, did you ever go I there? never saw, no, but I knew you went up there. We, we were there for maybe a year, if, at, if that. For the inception. Yeah. To, to get us off the floor, and then we moved to downtown San Francisco. Uh, but I was in Seattle. I was in Seattle for a PAX was this past weekend. I didn't actually get to uh, go to any actual PAX activities. I you regret. didn't get a, a limited edition of Space Rocks? Oh, I mean, I, I, I volunteered to help Gary pack Space Rocks into, in, like, make the boxes and put the rocks in the boxes, but he had, a, he had his kid. He had a whole team of people. So he was good. You know that meme, uh, it's gone too long, now I'm afraid to ask. I don't know what space rocks are. I'm afraid to ask. Is that a meme? Yeah, no, not space rocks, but it's it's the dude from uh, Community or whatever. You know the meme I'm talking about. You, are you guys seriously leaving me hanging here? Donald Glover? No, no, Star-Lord. He's not from Community. <laughs> he's from the sitcom. <laughs> he's, he's from Parks and Rec. Yes. He's talking with Chris Pratt. Yes, and, and he said... And there's, there's a meme. There's the meme where he doesn't know what something is, and it's been too long. Yes, well, I don't know what that, something, that meme is, and it has been too long. I don't know what space rocks are. Oh, uh, Okay, so it did originate from this podcast, and I bet you can look up the archives. Back when Will, Gary, and I were running the show here and doing this podcast every week, we used to have a segment called... Uh, what was it? it was it was uh it was after I forget what the segment was but after the show ended mm-hmm. fake out takes that's what it was oh my god right we used to do fake out takes it was like an hour long after the show just of 
bullshitting and just rambling and mostly letting Gary just, you know, just brain dump. What you basically what you get if you watch him on Twitch these days. Uh, and he came up with the idea of a tabletop game back when we were talking about how awesome the new wave of tabletop games were. You know, Will was really into Dominion and we had all played Catan and we were doing things at the Game of Thrones board games. And he didn't really get tabletop games. Mm-hmm. So he came up with a game called Space Rocks. And in true Gary fashion. It's like the L. Ron Hubbard of board game designers. Yeah, may, maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, I can do this I too. could do this. You know, you want to get a rocks and the rule and the, the object of the game is to have all the rocks <laughs> by the end of the game. And hungry, hungry hippos, but And how you rocks. how you accomplish that? Up to you. Oh, wow. Violence, negotiation, throwing your existing rocks in which you would then lose rocks to maybe potentially gain more rocks. If you, it was more meditation on human nature <laughs> mm-hmm. and competition and 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 the rules of life. Uh, but you know, it took off. I think, and I think he even put a, he had a Twitter page for, for it. And he, he jokingly promised a Kickstarter. It was you know he very much got into the whole thing, and now he's brought it back. I think he's mentioned a bunch of times on uh, kind of funny on the show he's on. So he's weekly. re-explained it to yes. the current. Audience, yeah, and so he and uh, his wife then manufactured almost a hundred physical boxes with design. Looks great, right? yeah, it does look cool. And they had waivers that attendees signed to promise they couldn't, they wouldn't actually not play Space Rocks. You can buy it, but they promised not to play it. Why? Because to play it would be, I know, potentially disastrous. It's a <laughs> liability. <laughs> you don't want to sell a game that then could be. The, uh, the the object the tool for violence. You're just waiting to talk about Dragon Con. No, no, no. We're, I, we're holding this I off. Actually, <laughs> um, I was gonna say if you watch Gary's stream, twitch.tv mm-hmm. slash Gary Witta, there's Gary. a VAOD last night where I think he talked about um, uh, selling space rocks and just irritating Greg Miller endlessly yeah. by selling space rocks. So you can hear all about his stories from PAX. Yeah, it's a stupid game. Let's let's be clear about this. And he's very self aware that it's a stupid game. It's a stupid game, and, a stupid yeah. idea. By design. By design. But the fact that it has caught on and mm-hmm. that people have rallied around it maybe is very emblematic of internet culture today. And the fact that people are willing to shell out twenty dollars to buy a box of literal rocks. Mm-hmm. I think. Hey, they did it in the they, '60s. Right? Pet Rock was right. all the rage. Very true. Very you just true. got one. Yeah, yeah. And so Gary uh, sold out immediately, thirty boxes a day. And he also did the keynote. He did the keynote. It's wonderful. I think you could watch that on the Twitch VOD stream as well, uh, or uh, the the PAX VOD uh, somewhere. Uh, but they did get to catch up with him. Say hi to some other folks uh, at, at PAX. Uh, Tilt Five was there. Jerry Ellsworth, I, I, that was my one big, one big regret. If I had an extra day at PAX, I would have gone and pl- uh, checked out Tilt 5. They were showing interview. off the tech? They were sho- People got to put on the glasses. Like on the show floor? On, or like they, they had a booth. Doors. No, on the show floor. Anyone could go up there. They had a booth. And uh. you could. Uh, there are videos from PAX of attendees interviewing Jerry and, and, and checking out Tilt 5. And, and a lot of it looks like the cast AR stuff they had designed uh, but obviously they've spent more time refining the hardware, so it looks good. Mm. I, I really want to try it. So Tilt 5 was there. I think also uh, uh, Stormland from Insomniac was there, and they were showing multiplayer. So a little bummer oh, to get to check those cool. things out. Uh, but the things I did get to see, we'll talk about later on the show. All right. So that was that was this, this past weekend. Story this week. Okay, Kishore, it's the Kishore hour. Let's let's hear it. Here we go. Just just get ready. Last, this is the best con of the year. I just want to say, to be fair, it was the it was the Norman Chan hour last week with Galaxy's Edge. It's, it's true. It went on. I mean, kind of kind of like every week. <laughs> okay. If you look at like Sorry. when we used to record our audio or our podcasts on multi track, right, and I'd throw it into yeah. audition and premiere for editing, and you'd see the the waveforms, mm-hmm. and it's. You and me, kind of like pretty steady, bouncing, maybe me a lot for the peaks. And the Kishore is just like, boom, pop culture, science, (laughs) right? I expect to be very front-heavy Kishore this week. Excellent. Uh, Yeah, well, I think some people probably call me front-heavy Kishore these days. (laughs) The uh, Drag Con is my favorite con of the year. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but to me, it combines like just pure fandom uh, 
mayhem in the sense that the con doesn't close ever. Most cons run like 8 to 5 p.m. Dragon Con opens up and just goes 24-7 all the way until the con shuts down hmm. a few days later. It's in Atlanta. It's centered in um, five host hotels, three of which are connected to each other, the Hyatt, Marriott, and the Hilton. And there's 20-plus fan tracks that are hosting panels and conversations along with a main programming track where there's talks and stuff by um, celebrities and guests. There's everything you'd expect from a con. There's there's the store area, like the exhibition floor. There's a gaming area for tabletop gaming. Um, there's a lot of video gaming. There's even a guy that brought in like Japanese arcade games oh, this yeah. year for a Japanese area. That was huge at replay effects this year too. That must be a thing. Uh, so there's there's kind of a little bit for everything, everyone. The whole sort of architecture around this is really built on cosplay. I would say like one in four, maybe one in three people seem to be in cosplay. It's an oh. exceptional amount of cosplay. And the reason I love Dragon Con and it is my favorite con of the year is like I obviously love cosplay. But to me, it's not about the professionals getting out there. They're there. But it's about everyone doing it and sort of being welcomed and encouraged no matter what your sort of technical level is. I think actually some of my favorite cosplays are things that are sort of thrown together at the last minute. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll put up pictures of some of my favorites here in a second. But uh, this year there was uh, at the Sheraton, which is one of the hotels, on one of the nights, one of the speakers in one of the panel rooms had a small like fire. And they had to evacuate Whoa. the hotel. It was not a, a big deal. Everyone, wait, wait, which everyone hotel? Said, That's a big it hotel. Was a to... Sheraton. Okay, that's a small, a smaller offsite one. But it's it's still like a big thing. They had to evacuate a bunch of rooms and stuff. The next morning, in like somewhere like in the Hilton or Marriott, there's somebody who built a speaker out of a cardboard box, like painted it up. And like made it on fire and is walking around as the Sheraton speaker cosplay. Oh my god. That is what this convention is, is just like a giant joke. And it didn't matter that, you know, it was obviously like thrown together last minute, it just sort of perfectly encapsulates the feeling of the moment. Do you want to see some pictures? Yes. Yeah, and so then I'll it, describe some of my best moments. So for those of you who are listening to the podcast and not watching the video, one, you could watch the video. It's on YouTube. But we could also, we're going to try to do our best to paint word pictures and describe the things that Kishore saw. Uh, we're going to, maybe Kishore, you're going to throw these up on uh, maybe an imager gallery. Yeah, and, sure. And then we'll link that in the show notes. Um, so uh, these are just random shots from the Dragon Con I, floor. I got to do one of the things I've always wanted to do. I played chess with a Jawa. So there's this kid that sets up a chess table and he's dressed as a Jawa for no reason. He's like a master level chess player. Um, and on the and he collects money to donate to charity. And he sits there for about eight hours playing chess with anyone that will walk up with there's, to him. There's a sign above him that says, play chess with a Jawa. And the Jawa's saying, Utini! <laughs> of course it is. There's, it seems to be a And he patches. will say Utini. <laughs> He will. <laughs> is that Jawa for checkmate? Uh, and he is checkmate in five. Very good. He's like oh. a ranked chess player. Whoa! <laughs> and it's like it was like one of these like fabled Dragon Con things that I've never seen before. There are patches that he happened. made with the Jawa and chess pieces, as well as a placard for the Tatooine Planetary Chess Federation <laughs> (TPCF). It just it's it's so out of this world. It's hilarious. Let's see. I'm I'm a little disappointed that the chess pieces were not Star Wars theme though. Uh, they do sell them. He's not playing Dejaric with people. He's uh, playing chess. I mean, still you can get the Star Wars themed chess pieces. All right, this is a, a cosplay <gasps> yes. group I'm part of called the Stonecutters, uh, which is a from an obscure Simpsons episode where they make a stonemasons. The Episode is now over 26 years old. My goodness. There's 29 of us there, and we walk around and you sing the song. We have the fabled parchment. One of the people has the chosen one tattoo on his butt. It's really ridiculous. It's fantastic. Uh, do you know who this is, Norm? It's Well, I see the pictures of a uh, Bob Ross slash Dalek. Uh, da Dalek uh, co you know, cross cosplayer crossover. But it's not Davros the Dalek. It's Bob Ross the Dalek. Mm. Oh, that's right. So it's a Bob Clever. Ross Dalek that was just wandering around. Bob Ross, one of the hits of the con, 
it was probably the third most popular outfit I saw. There was a lot of Bob Rosses. Is that so ro- this is, is that robotic or is he walking around? Uh, it was uh, this one. He was walking around. Okay. I, there were robotic uh, Daleks and, all over. The place. And for people listening, the Dalek is the lower half of the costume, with the top half being a more traditional Bob Ross of the wig and uh, the paint palette. Uh, what do you think the most popular costume was at Dragon Con? Oh, it's got to be Stranger Things. Uh, the uh, Scoops Ahoy. Kids. Scoops Ahoy. Everywhere. Yeah. It was the number it. one costume by a mile. I mean, you know, like the answer is usually Deadpools because there's Deadpools everywhere. You can't stop the Deadpools. You can only hope to contain them. Where are people getting their Scoops Ahoy so costume? There, there's, um, you know, ready made like Halloween kind of Scoops Ahoy costumes. And so there are all sorts of Scoops Ahoy mashups everywhere. But Scoops Ahoy dominating the con. This one is was one of my favorites, and the photo detail here isn't great, but it's a Captain America with a Psylocke, but the Captain America is all hydrated out, yeah. and so he changed the, the helmet to have a Hydra symbol. His, um, his chest armor has a Hydra symbol. You can't see his shield, but it has a Hydra symbol, and all the work he did wasn't just sort of like simple foam. It was um, like the shield was metal and did like a metal overlay with the Hydra symbol. It looked really, really good. Um, this is the fat lady in the painting, which is a Harry Potter cosplay. She set up a frame and just sat in the middle of the painting, like posing as if she was drinking wine. Um, this guy, uh, who is in some red costume, still don't know what it is, <laughs> attached a hibachi to himself and was just cooking food in the middle of the Marriott. Oh, okay. He's, so you got you to paint a better word picture. This is someone in a bodysuit wearing completely red bodysuit, including a hood with a red backpack and it seems to be a friend next to him also in a red body suit holding up there is like eight a of Japanese them. sign and when you say hibachi like there is a full on little kitchen counter that he's attached to in the front with sauces with a with a what, what is that like a some kind of gr- gas grill gas there. grill exactly right he has a butane gas grill attached to his costume and he was making food that you could just buy this guy was made, made cookable cosplay a thing. <laughs> uh, these are the real Infinity Stones. What? Like the power to wipe out half of humanity was just in Dragon Con. Um, and some of the the prop master, Russell from Marvel, was there. Russell Bobbitt, yeah. Uh, and he just had an aluminum case that you could walk up to and you, you'd open it and all the stones. Were this just is one there of the, laid the, out. the best things that happens at cons that people don't know about. It's in San Diego as well. Russell Bobbitt is the, you can Google him, uh, he's the prop master at Marvel. In, working out of the workshop in Atlanta, he, he and his team are the ones who make you know, Mjolnir, Cap Shield, and all the variations, and 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 I have Agamotto, and, cl- and also the Infinity Gauntlet. You know, these aren't contracted out; they're done in house. And Russell's brought the actually one. He's post pictures of them on Instagram, so you can follow him there. Uh, but he's actually brought the original props to conventions to show and done panel talks about the making of them. And they're usually not highly impacted, so they're not like Hall H panels. You can easily get into them. You could really just go up and talk about the process with them. And and see them up close because they're not behind glass. They're the, just right there. These are screen used infinity gems? Yeah. I mean they're multiple sets, so it's yeah, hard yeah, yeah. to tell like, you know, which is in what, you know, scene, et cetera, et cetera. And he's got them displayed well because they have LEDs underneath them and mm-hmm. they light up. That's pretty awesome. Uh this was mentioned on Still Entitled. This is John and his fiance Allie. Um, they're the cosplayers. His uh Instagram handles Lone Wolf1183. Uh, they do cosplay out of Atlanta, and they made these Benny outfit uh, uh, outfits from Lego that are astronaut costumes. And uh, so I walked up to John, and I was talking to him. And when he sort of we figured out who um, who I was, he mentioned that he had taken that comp cooler, which Adam mentioned on Still Untitled, which is the cooling vest that has like an automated switch. I think he wore it in his Chewbacca outfit. Uh, and I had been wearing inside my Mayor McCheese outfit, and he had um, essentially sort of hacked it a little bit and stuck it inside both of these Benny outfits. This was one of the best costumes of the con for me. Um, just like it was really brilliant blue. Uh, it looked like astronaut suits. All the patch details that they had uh, down the side were, were elegant. They had uh, like a wonderful flag to go along with them. 
Uh, and just knowing that they derive like their cooling mechanism from listening to a still t- untitled episode what, just kind of strikes me as awesome. What is the flag? Uh, it's a flag of the planet, and like Benny has it on his it's a, ship. It's a le- it's a Lego thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the Fast Food Avengers, which yes. I'm part of, and so you can see my Marvel McCheese. I'm there with McThor, Basque Fury, which is a Baskin Robbins Valkyrie, Wendy's nice. Widow, um, Colonel America. Uh, we wandered around. It was um, it was sort of a blast being in that outfit. So you really buried the lead here. You brought your Mayor McCheese cosplay, and you've modified it to be a Captain Marvel hybrid. The yeah, the Marvel Mohawk McCheese. with the the fries. Yeah, so good. It's Mohawk made out of French fries. I skinned the top with uh, as if it, it's the Captain Marvel red um, cow helm cow with with room for the mohawk to come out. By the way, there were so many of those that were really well done that were sort of lit up mm. like authentic ones. Uh, and I had like boots and pants and, and a jacket and a sash, I had everything. Did you make the boots? Uh, I didn't make the boots. I made like parts of the boots, but I used some like Captain Marvel-esque boots and then like kind of skinned them out. We, uh, so this is the Mod Podge. A container, like a person came oh. as the mascot, and this person works for Plaid, the company that that oh, actually makes okay. Mod Podge, who actually showed up to it. And so, the funny thing is, I was hanging out with Bill Duran a lot, um, and the night before, we were having drinks and just joking around because he had seen this cos- cosplay group called the Bargers, and they were all people that had half made cosplay items and were wearing shirts that said "I barge," and they were like as if they were just building their cosplay and were barging them together with cement. It was a real deep cosplay maker cut. And we were joking around. I'm like, yeah, you know, next thing you know, you're going to go out tomorrow and there'll be a Mod Podge uh, cosplay. And then he sends me this picture the next day. He sends me a picture of him standing next to it. This is one I took later. Um, and Plaid really like embraced like the cosplay community. They've always been more of a company that catered towards crafters, but since everyone in the community, especially ones that make foam armor, uh, largely use this to smooth over their foam, uh, they're wandering around uh, as a container of Mod Podge. A uh, Mod Podge. I always say Mod It's this big Podge. jar. Yeah. It's this giant jar of it. It was great. Um, here's oh, a, incredible. A Manda Shawan. From Fifth Element. From Fifth Element. There was two different ones walking around. I actually don't know who is in this one. This is Bill's picture. Uh, it's just more like life, beyond life size, these giant creatures from Fifth Element. Uh, and it just, it looks spectacular. It was lit up with lights on the front. Uh, these creatures like are in, uh, human in the uh, humanoid in the in the just barest sense of the word, um, <laughs> and so it was just amazing act of puppetry because their head inside this costume is not within the head of the actual outfit, so they're kind of like puppeting while also walking around inside of this thing, and it was just sort of an amazing feat of of design. They don't they waddle, right? No. Oh yeah, they're waddling. I mean, like the person inside was waddling. I think it sort of uh, fit the character. Uh, this is a cosplayer. Let me make sure I get her name. Nerdish. She goes by Nerdish Cosplay. Her name's Sarah Park. And this photo's by uh, Andrew uh, Liptak, uh, who's a friend of Tessid. She made a steampunk infinity gauntlet. That's super cool. It looks just gorgeous. Is, uh, that, is that a compass on her arm? Yeah, that's it's that's steampunk. That's pretty man. awesome. You better know which direction you're pointing when you <laughs> wipe out half the universe. Uh, I just love like the mashup designs of like that you that you see with things like this. Um, this is the one that went the most viral on Twitter. This is the never ending story of uh, with a, somebody playing Atreyu and Atrax the the horse who dies in the the swamp of sorrows I think it's called or swamp of stat sadness. And uh, everyone was like scarred on Twitter when they saw this picture because this is the death scene for the horse. Let me tell you, I saw this in person in the Marriott. The kid is screaming the whole time in the in the cosplay. It makes it so much worse. It's commitment <laughs> it is so much commitment. I fully respect it. Um, here's Bill and his wife Brittany, who's in an amazing Assaultron, which was one of is just great to see her out in that costume again uh, with Odin Abbott from the channel Odin Makes. He makes a lot of great props in this Batman cosplay. 
I, I hung out with Odin a bit. He had a casual Thanos cosplay, which is hilarious, and like a Hawaiian shirt. He did a bunch. And he makes a lot of different props on his channel. He was a really great guy. Um, this guy had the most commitment. He's literally like in a, what, what is that, a gamepad? Is it like a PS Vita? What, what would we call it? Oh, that's a, ga that's, that's a, that's a ga um, uh, GPA. Yeah. Game Boy Advance. Game Boy Advance. Someone He's, is wearing a human-sized Game Boy Advance with what looks like a 36-inch LCD as a display. He's wearing it over his neck with real giant buttons. Well, the screen is dressed up to look like a Game Boy Advance, and he's wearing a Mario hat, and then the controllers, the GameCube controllers are coming off of it. Ah. So he had a GameCube like in behind where the TV is, and people were playing Smash Brothers on his costume. And but the funny this thing is, is playable cosplay. You told me he was tethered to the wall. <laughs> yeah, so he's <laughs> plugged into the wall to power the television and GameCube. So he had to like stay there next to the wall. This is somebody basically cosplaying as a TV stand and I loved it. It makes no sense. <laughs> I love it. Um yes, I played Smo Super Smash Brothers on this. Uh, this is a Roberto from Futurama. Futurama. My favorite. Hey, he's been at the con before. My favorite part. I actually don't know who this person is. Um, but if you go up to him and you go, ha ha, he goes, ha ha, right back at stabbing you. Stabbing you. Stabbing the motion. The stabby sound. Um, this is for Norm. This is a Skeksis. Oh, yes. Skeksis. And I saw two different Skeksis at the con. Ooh. One is from, <laughs> from prop maker Alyssa Smith, I think is her name. Um, I, I don't think that she's in this one, but they're both had different puppeted heads and the detail on like the Skeksis is really intense. The velvet robe. It's, it, this I believe is, looks like the Chamberlain. Yeah. This one's the Chamberlain and the other one I think was a scientist. Mm -hmm. Most of the dark crystal, the Chamberlain is stripped of his garbs. Yeah. The, I think this looks more like the Chamberlain from the, the movie. The right? beginning of the movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was I mean, these are exceptional creations, like getting all the hair on there. and Yeah, that's and, insane. Uh, we have the entire Top Gun fleet here. <laughs> wow. Okay, you got to describe this. This is uh, a photo. From, uh, I think Brownell Combs is the uh, is one of the cosplayers, and the photos from Eurobeat uh, Kasumi Photo. Uh, but you have people wearing uh, different jets around their waist. So it's, not, it's a photo of nine cosplayers. And they're, most of them are wearing flight suits, right? Your, your pilot flight suits. But around their waist, it's almost like they have uh, the, the power, uh, what are those cars called? Um, the power wheels, except they're cardboard or foam fighter jets that basically are just hugging their waist, almost like they're like floaties, right, for a pool. But they're super serious with their aviators on. And then this woman in the back is holding a giant volleyball. I think she is the volleyball. She's the volleyball net. and the net. <laughs> it's an integral scene. Yes, absolutely. One, one guy is the danger zone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these constant deep cuts are happening. The group cosplays here were amazing. So one of the things I've always heard about is there's a March of the Elves. I forget what that's called from Lord of the Rings, where the elves all go marching. Mm. And there was like 20 different elves that all had their like ceremonial things. They were swinging around that marched from one hotel through three hotels, not stopping, and just went on this march the whole time. And so I'm like chasing them down to get a picture. And then the other way is the Mando march happens. All these like 50 Mandalorians start coming the other way at you. These group cosplays are one of my favorite parts of Dragon Con. There was the um, there was multiple inflatable. What are those things that like why the wavy there? wavy persons? Wavy, yeah, wavy uh, crazy inflatable arm men. Yes, yes. There is multiple parades of those characters wandering around too. People dressed as those noodles. Yes, huh? And wandered around the con. Uh, this is um, Matt Hobbs Wally, and there was a ton of droids out. Um, the oh, Wally. See. Uh, had the best experience because kids just love Wally. -E and by kids, mouse I mean droid. me. Uh, there was mu multiple mouse droids. There was uh, brand new designs of droids you've never seen from any um, uh, cosplays. There was uh, there was a whole march of BB-8s that where they they followed a human BB-8 as if they were ducklings in descending size order. <laughs> um, and 
uh, on the Stonecutters floor, we had, like they they all uh, are on the same floor of a hotel. Uh, this guy heard us screaming uh, and came down, and he had a chopper and an R two that he had three D printed, and so and then just started taking it apart for us to look inside the guts. That's the best part of Dragon Con is like we see uh, bots like this at other cons, but where can where can you spend like an hour with the builder where he starts showing you the guts of it on the inside? It's like part Maker Fair, part con at that point. Um, and that's also, it's Wally. Wally's the best. Uh, this is Yaya Han, one of the most famous cosplayers with Bill. Uh, she had a really stunning um, kind of feathered dragon armor display. Uh, she was out for multiple days, but she's just hanging out in the crowd. Like one of the most famous cosplayers in the world, just hanging out, just socializing with people, which is basically how Dragon Con feels. Like there's no difference between you and famous person next to you. And Bill with, uh, I think his name is Sean Bradley, who did a yondu, but his yondu had had the arrow and he had done lighting, I think via a fiber optic cable through the arrow back into his suit. So you could see, you could hear the whistling uh, almost as the red light comes through. Uh, and you'll see like multiple scoops of Hoy in the background. Um, I want to just share two other things from Dragon Con that I think made this um, experience so delightful. One is from our friend Kevin Close, who is a Tormund uh, cosplayer. You might remember him from New York Comic Con, where he uh, proposed to his wife um, uh, with the help of us. He and uh, some other Tormunds got together with a uh, Brienne uh, and surrounded her <laughs> and made a quite the viral video. Um, and I think I have the names of the cosplayers here. There's... <laughs> Uh, Brienne is played by um, uh, Katrina Thomason. Uh, there's uh, one of the Tormans is uh, Matthew Daroth, uh, Siley cosplay, Kevin Close, our friend ZJ, and Hickman twenty nine eighty eight. It is is just awesome. This is part of from uh, some of the group shots. Uh, but to close, we have to talk about uh, the cult of John. The Cult of John. This is a phenomenon that popped up for just this Dragon Con. Yeah, so every year people send stuff through FedEx because there's so many costumes and people are just shipping stuff. And FedEx put a stand-up, like, cardboard cutout, like, you, and it says, you can't miss us, and it's just some generic guy holding a FedEx package. Well... Life-size standee. Yeah, life-size standee. And, like, you know, sometime... And during the early days of the con, people put a couple googly eyes on this. Oh, no yes. big deal. Yeah. Well, that escalated vandalized. because it's dra- dragon. Yeah, so they got some vandalized. It escalated to, um, a, you know, putting some arrows on his head, starting to draw on him. Before you know it, uh, this standee is uh, adorned with characters <laughs> from Mister Rogers. Um, he's, he's adorned with like lays the, and like people start decorating him as if he's an idol, um, with stickers. Like you can see, um, if you're watching the video, there's a sticker of Captain America saying, I want you on the package now. Um, it goes so crazy that he just becomes littered with stuff all over him. He has like every patch sticker, uh, that you can imagine on this on this character. He's saying stuff. And then the standee disappears one night. <gasps> no. It just disappears. And Abandoned. people and oh, people no. can't believe John has left us. So they start This is not left over from the standee. This is people leaving things. People start <laughs> an altar tribute to John where they start leaving remnants from Dragon Con. In support of John Balloons, returning. stickers, coffee cups, dolls, uh, all sorts of, of like tchotchkes. Liquor, like you yeah, just bottles need. of liquor, plenty of those, yeah. Yes. Uh, and notes. People start writing personal notes on how they miss John. I will always love you, John. <laughs> I watched you grow, John, and you were taken from us too soon. Uh, and the altar grows... Uh, to the point where people start just it, it it just grows out of whack, and the cleaning staff leaves it there. Yes, <laughs> I don't think the cleaning staff works those four days. Oh, really? No, well, they do. Oh, they, <laughs> they do. They work really hard. Um, it's just hard to keep up with that many people. There was rumors of John reappearing in other hotels. Some people <gasps> got pictures. 
of him. But what happens, and I don't have pictures of this, is people create a new John out of FedEx boxes. What? They like craft a new John uh, and start, and then there are all these pictures of people praying in front of John, like where they kneel down in front of the new John. It's a false idol. John. It is a false John. Uh, but now wow. there is literally a Church of John that exists amongst Dragon Con members. And, and this, now burned in the Dragon Con Is that real or is that a Photoshop? Uh, no, no. Somebody did a Photoshop okay. of him uh, getting dusted. Um, all I want to say is this encapsulates Dragon Con, is people being over the top and ridiculous and fun and friendly and working together for to create a collective that that really makes no sense. I went to so many panels and conversations and said hello uh, to you know hundreds of people. It was just a, a brilliant time. It's my favorite kind of the year. So if you're into cosplay, if you're into science, if you're into making, if you're into um, just having a more relaxed fan run experience, Dragon Con is for you. This reminds me of the, the John phenomenon. Reminds me of that podcast, uh, Criminal. This is Criminal uh, about the Buddha in Oakland. You guys heard about this? The Buddha. Like, yeah. the yeah, Adam was telling I about this. Heard earlier. about it an hour ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, I didn't realize that. But uh, yeah, it's a it's it's a phenomenon where a uh, someone put up a Buddha statue bought from like a Lowe's or a Home Depot or an Ace Hardware at a big intersection in Oakland uh, in order to s- prevent people from throwing garbage at this little uh, cr- crosswalk intersection, and then uh, local members of the community started then adorning it with. You know objects and, and built a whole shrine around it um, because who doesn't love Buddha yeah, and who right. doesn't love FedEx? Can we talk about cosplay just for a moment? Because yeah. I, I I'm not a cosplayer. I've I came to tested years ago, kind of green to the thing. I, I really didn't know much about the community, and I think to outsiders it might appear to be all about role playing, but it appears that it's it's a more about showing off a mix of technical and creative skills. No, I I I kind of disagree with that. Well, tell me. So I feel like cosplay to me is different than it is to how it is for Adam. I think it's probably different for how it is for Bill. I think it's different for how it is for the person that made like the cardboard uh, Sheraton fire speaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, To me, it's about inhabiting characters that I love and having a really good time. So like I dress up as Mayor McCheese and I order a hundred cheeseburgers from a local McDonald's and I wander around and I hand out cheeseburgers and I tell people to reelect me and I'll hand out cards um, that if they actually scan the cards, it takes them to a register to vote page. So I just play as if I am a mayor Mm -hmm. of McDonald's land that doesn't exist. And there's something about that sort of role playing that works for me. Uh, Other people really love the craft, the like, the building of it, the the technical aspects, as you uh, as you allude to, some people really love it just for the camaraderie, like joining with a whole group of other people to wander around. Some people are there just to people watch and just to enjoy the experience of of seeing other people in costume. What I find is that, um, and I think the reason I re- love Dragon Con the most is. I'm not the most technical person. And, and oftentimes it can be quite intimidating being here and seeing like people like Adam and Bill work and seeing how much craft and and uh, experience they have. I don't have that kind of like technical capabilities within me, even though I aspire to some of those things. But I feel just as welcomed with my, you know, kind of crappy Mayor McCheese outfit because I'm enjoying myself yeah. and people react to that. And I think that's sort of the best of Dragon Con is when you see other people inhabiting characters in a way they just love it. So it doesn't matter if their costume's great. It's about that joy of being a fan of the whatever the thing you're in. Uh, And having that sort of shared experience amongst people, even when you don't recognize what it is or even if it's not done the best, is one of the most joyous experiences I think you can have as fans. And... Uh, to see it shift in a way where it's less about buying this costume or you know buying this figure of this costume, but a shared experience that you get to co-create with other people, I think there the there's a that's a real occupies a real special place in my heart. I mean, it's a form of self-expression where you feel transformed. I mean, anyone who's put on a costume for Halloween can test that putting on any type of costume, you feel different. 
right? If you put on armor, you feel more powerful. If you put on makeup, you feel like you're, you know, it's a different skin. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're more comfortable in that new skin. Right. But cosplay, like, there's so many store bought costumes on Halloween, and and cosplay is. And there are. 99% about making it yourself. I mean, mean, there are here, too, at DragonCon. A lot of people are buying off the shelf things. But I don't think that matters. I think what matters is Mm. how you inhabit that. Um, really, that costume. See, I the thing I admire most is that mix of creative and technical, you know, um, skills. Because the, a lot of people are strong in one and not the other. But when you're strong in both, I find that very admirable, and that that makes me excited. But it's yeah. also this com- that, that combined with fandom that makes it somewhat different than where you might see those skill sets combined elsewhere. Like, there's a thing called the demo scene that I've always been sort of a fan of, which is very much that creative and technical sides mashed together. But it's not necessarily in in homage or you know in celebration of anything except the demo scene. Like the when it comes to cosplay, it's about being expressing your fandom of something else, whether it's television, movies. What I think have you. oftentimes the people that are making their own costume are infusing it with a lot more of that joy and mm-hmm. love and that fan experience, and you feel that. Uh, but people can do that with a store bought thing too. I I think we we can't get trapped in the idea that cosplay is only at this certain level. Um, because it it starts to put uh, like money money gates, financial gates mm-hmm. on who who gets to be at these things, and that's not what it's about to me. Dragon Con's not without its faults. Don't get me wrong. There's lots of things that you know are uh, emerge as problems, especially when you bring like eighty thousand people together. There's always problems, but I think the heart of this of just having a social experience that is centered in in dressing up. Um, and getting away yeah. is is really fantastic. Odds I can't on, recommend it. Odds no. on seeing a John cosplay next year? Oh, a thousand percent. <laughs> a thousand percent. Um, uh, last thing before we go, thanks to everyone that ca- came and said hello. A lot of them said they watch this podcast all the time. I immediately apologized. Um, but they. Um, it, it seems like Tested has held a, a special place in many cosplayers and makers' hearts, and it was great to hear stories like that. We love you back. A little bit light on the pop culture this week, especially given the past two weeks when we had both D23 and also the major news bombs of The Matrix and Sony's uh, Spider-Man. But still, a few things to talk about. First of all, uh, Joker is coming out soon, and there are early reviews. It's still about a month. Yeah, early. It's super early, early. So it shows high confidence on the part of the studio. I also think it was a uh, premiere at the Venice Film Festival. That's where a lot of press got to see it early. But uh, the reviews are very kind. People are really loving it. 10 out of 10, says IGN. Wow. Uh, whoa. I'm getting... That was interesting. That was a little bit of a sound. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Don't touch anything. I'm not going to touch anything. Uh, but I still am a little skeptical. Good. I think that can only improve your viewing experience. Yeah. The thing I keep hearing, and I haven't delved deep into the reviews, is that Joaquin Phoenix gives an all-time performance. Completely believe that. Like, he's yeah. a high-caliber actor. I think it's going to be deeply unsettling, like any Joker mo- should be. What I'm really hoping for is I think the best of the Joker is where you don't un- you don't really know what was real and not at the end because the Joker lies. Like, that's the number one thing. Like, that's what Heath Ledger did throughout Dark Knight. We don't know his origin story. Well, unreliable narrator, yeah. It's a yes. big part of that in the mythology of the Joker in the comics and also in the Dark Knight. But I don't know if you're going to have that is it through the lens of his telling the story or is it ob- objective lens of just you know a camera put on him and his journey I, I i hope you're right i really would love that to be the case i don't know like I, we had talked about you know what if this joker isn't the joker right if it's just a downfall of a man but it really does evoke a lot of that that uh was michael douglas film downfall falling down F- or falling down yep uh, not, not downfall that was the hitler movie yeah uh, falling down and it feels like that but in the dc universe so uh, I think I'm going to watch it. I just I'm going to uh, I'm going to take this enthusiasm I mean, be, with a grain of salt. To be fair, Norm watched Dark Phoenix this weekend, so he's skeptical of everything. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. You know that those are the villains are supposed to be the scrolls in that movie. What? Yeah, did you? you didn't see I've it? seen it. You've seen it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the shapeshifters, Jessica Chastain. They were supposed to be the scrolls. I guess they're, uh. but they weren't called the scrolls. Anyway, moving on. 
Uh, what I did get to see was The Dark Crystal, a few episodes of that on Netflix. Mm-hmm. How many and episodes are there? There are 10 episodes. They are about an hour long. Holy Kind cannoli. of 50 minutes to an hour long each, even over that. So it's almost around 10 hours of Dark Crystal. What I did not know, because I haven't reached the end of the series, is that there's a whole documentary that they made, Netflix made, that is about the making of this show. I thought they were going to drop that on Netflix a week later. It turns out that's the bonus credit scene. The whole documentary is unlocked once you watch the final episode. You It's not unlocked until you watch it? Or, or scroll to the end. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. scroll to the credits. I'm four episodes in. I wasn't prepared for just how enormous and just sort of sweeping... Uh, the landscapes are. I mean, the puppets are, evoke the 1980 movie. I think they look similar. It looks better because you're watching in HD now. But the the entire like landscape behind them, the hmm. larger story that gets filled in, because the movie just like kind of zooms through a lot of the background on the characters. It, there is like a whole world that they spend a lot of time building. And I'm only four episodes in. It was, and it's more intense than I thought. Are you watching it with your son? I was, no, because I started watching it, and I think it's too intense for him. This show is not for children. It's, it is for children. It's totally for children. But yeah, it's. I'm really curious what younger audiences will think of it, because yeah. one, they don't have the nostalgia factor. The pace of the original Dark Crystal is kind of slow for, you know, in terms of films. Definitely. Right? 80s films are a little slower, yeah. even though it's a kid's film. But we all have this fond memory of that the world building they did mm-hmm. with the orrery and and, and and all the mystics like they built their own language and their whole the whole character design you saw glimpses of things that you knew had a further history because they would talk about uh, the thousand years had passed since the or some of the Skeksis ruled well and at the time you'd never seen puppets or muppets applied in any way that was anything more than g you know, yeah. you you knew them from Sesame Street the muppet movies but it was all that was so cute and you know and the, which is great, and I love those, but The Dark Crystal took it and amped it up to a slightly more adult. A little more mature. Yeah. yeah it's actually kind of scary, a little little bit of a nightmare Definitely. fuel for children. Uh, and there's some of that here, uh, but you're right, Kishore, it's, it's sweeping in terms of the different... It r- reminds me of Game of Thrones, and because of the different factions and the clans of the Gelfings, uh, but also uh, Lord of the Rings in terms of the different landscapes. There's the underground world. There's the the, the library. There's the different, yeah, it's different groups. Uh, I, I really love uh, the main characters. The voice acting is spectacular. How many stars are in this thing? I could thing? not believe it. Like, you can't even count how many of them there yeah. are. They're like, every single person is is somebody famous. I have not watched it yet because I'm still trying to get my kids on board, and uh, we just haven't found the time. So I'm, I'm holding off. But how do you find the CG? Is it intrusive? Is it perfect? Not intrusive at all. It looks good. It's I'm- pretty seamless. Some characters, like some of the creatures, they have to do CG because they're moving so quickly that mm-hmm. you, you couldn't puppet it. But the main uh, Gelfings are not CG. It, you more have to get used to the practical side of this, that there are these puppets that don't have full facial mm. animation and stuff. And so that was actually the bigger leap for me as being as accepting of the puppets. Hmm. Right. There's a little bit of uncanny value there because everything, the production value is so high, you almost like have to realize these are still puppets. They can't be as expressive as a CG character, as a, a, a human actor in makeup. So... And they move a little funny because they're puppets. Yeah, like, so it's, it's still a puppet show. And um, if you watch it as such, it's the best produced puppet show ever made. <laughs> um, I guess that's, I mean, I don't want to go into spoilers, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's fantastic. There's, there's fizzy gigs. I didn't realize it was, I mean, is this a spoiler saying that it's a prequel? <gasps> no, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, I didn't get that until I was like, you know, 10 minutes into the, into the first episode. I mean, the, then the, I figured it out. It, Sigourney Weaver in the narration, like pretty clearly sets out that this is you know before the events of Dark Crystal. Before the Crystal, I didn't crack. watch the movie before uh, I started the show. Do you recommend watching I the movie? One hundred percent recommend watching the movie, even though this is a prequel show. Watching the movie really gives you all the groundwork for the things they dive deeper on. But yes, I agree that because it is a prequel, you kind of. 
know that where it's heading toward, even though the end of the first season probably doesn't get you right to the beginning of the movie. They're going to leave room for a second season. But, you know, it's it's going to, like, the beginning of Dark Crystal in the movie is, n- the world is not, Thrall is not a happy place. So, no. you know, there's n- only one direction the show can really head toward, n- inevitability. Uh, another thing that makes it worth watching the original is the Skeksis are much more fleshed out in the show. So getting a sense that there are the 10 Skeksis in the beginning of the movie, I think eight by the time you get to the end of the movie, um, those individual Skeksis characters from the Chamberlain, who's voiced by Simon Pegg, to the scientist voiced by Mark Hamill, uh, Aquafina is a voice of the collector, I believe, the wonderful voice performances that give them a lot more personality than just the visual styling we got from the movie. Cool. Uh, last week, we talked about Galaxy's Edge a lot, and one of the things that broke news stories that broke last week was the TSA had banned mm-hmm. from Galaxy's Edge the soda bottles, the Sprite and Diet Coke and Coke bottles that were shaped like Star Wars-themed thermal detonators. Mm-hmm. TSA would not allow you to bring them on board or even check them in. Well, we have an update for that. TSA has now reconsidered. It's weird. And they're allowing you to check them in but not carry them on board. Oh, before you couldn't even check them. You couldn't even check them in. That's really odd. Yeah. I mean, it's a science fiction weapon. But it's still shaped like, spherically like, like a, a grenade. Like a grenade? Is that why? That is exactly why. But you, so the current rules state you still couldn't bring on couldn't, a toy grenade. Or you, know, you couldn't bring, you can, no, you could never bring on a yeah. toy grenade or a toy gun, right? We've right. had friends who try to bring on, carry on, you know, castings of film props and, and things that they've made that look like, you know, blasters, space blasters, and they have them had, have had them even checked, taken away. Checked, I think it's, it's fine. Well, that we're saying that you couldn't even check these. I doubt, that's why they've reconsidered the rules. Very strange. I need my $6 thermal detonator Diet Coke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 550 plus tax. Uh, so... We also have some TV news. I'm going to wrap up pop culture relatively quickly. We have a premiere date for the HBO Watchmen show, and it's going to be in about a month and a half, October 20th at 9 p.m. Sunday. It's a Sunday night show. It's kind of taking that Game of Thrones slot is when we're going to get that. So, again, this is another show that I'm, I'm maybe less excited for, given all the TV stuff that's coming. I'm on the south end of meh about this. Mm. Like. Yeah. It, like we were at in San Diego, and when they were doing a lot of promo stuff, and nothing really kind of caught me around some of the world building. That being said, HBO has an amazing track record. Yeah, we should give them the benefit of the doubt. I would be more than happy for this to be a slow burn and a show that I can maybe binge later. Because in terms of HBO shows, even there's His Dark Materials and also Westworld season three that I'm way more excited for. And across the the premium TV landscape, well, we have Disney Plus right on the horizon. Speaking of which, the Disney Plus launching November 12th is gonna have The Mandalorian, and we got another set photo. This Worth calling out. You might want to put this up if possible because a lot of people are pointing out, myself included, this set photo production still looks like, well, it looks like a, a, some stage action figures. I can't find the photo. You can't find the photo. Well, Entertainment not, Weekly has it. It's not in the show notes. Oh, I apologize. What do you mean it looks like a, what did it say? It stage, it looks like it looks like Kenner action figures posed. Is it like a tilt shift photo? It's not tilt shift. People are, are postulating that it's that's because it's tilt shift. I think it's because uh, they had the photographer probably couldn't get up close. <laughs> like the, the actors weren't gonna. It was probably during a choreographed fight scene, and the actors weren't gonna hold their pose. It's not like a cosplay photo, right? right. So the uh, still photographer, production photographer, probably had to stand back a little bit and get a little more of a, a wide shot. But I doesn't that s- look exactly just like what you mean. a just a stage action figure shot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the Mandalorian, the titular character, it's fighting two aliens. They're not Bosk, but they're two two aliens. Uh, but the way that they're all presented with their clothing and the, even the way their joints are bent at the knees. It's, it's, it's also really the, like the ground beneath them, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's weird too. Like the, there's definitely some touch-ups or something happening around that border of that leg. Mm, you know, see where it's like the yeah. white glow. Yeah. yeah. It's also like stuff like the cape doesn't look like it's it's really Perfectly in motion. flowing. Yeah, it, it looks, looks like something up. that's been propped up. So <laughs> it's this it's really funny looking... And there's nothing from the trailer that would indicate no. 
a look like this. I really want to believe it's intentional. It's probably not. Probably just a circumstance that this is, you know, the best place that they could get a photo. Um, uh, yeah. But it's just an interesting. I'm with dope. you. I want to believe it's intentional. Yeah. Um, moving over to, to Star Trek. Well, Picard. We have some light Picard news on the production side. Uh huh. Principal photography is finished on Picard. Now they're moving into post-production, VFX. A lot of cast members, directors, showrunner Rico Shabon posted pictures on uh, social media. Uh, they filmed, I believe, one of the last scenes at the Vasquez Rocks in Southern California by Joshua Tree. So uh, is it by Joshua Tree? Vasquez yeah, it's Rocks? close. Yeah, I it's, mean... Uh, yeah. And, we you know, iconic location for science fiction and Star Trek, of course. Uh, so... Picard's coming early next year, and now it's all about editing, and and it's all in the can. Do you think this will be more of a um, this will entice more viewers than Discovery did? One hundred percent, hundred percent, thousand percent. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a question of it's kind of I would think it would be more of a gamble because do you are can you count on forty somethings to sign up for a new service? You can or, count on forty yeah. something with disposable income. To have more disposable income than or, millennials, or do you want to, you know, count on people who want something new and, and edgier, like Discovery? You're gonna get both. Well, yeah, I, I I don't know if, how much crossover there is. Like for me, I'm definitely more of a Picard guy. Mm -hmm. um, but I assume since they went with Discovery and they put they went all in on it, that there's definitely a demographic for that too. I mean. Maybe even a, a more sure one. With two seasons of Discovery, they probably got as many. Star Trek fans as they were going to get mm. for CBS All Access. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. If you weren't bought in one season one and season two, mm -hmm. I don't know if numbers grew, but it was for a start. It was the first Star Trek TV show in a long time. Mm -hmm. You weren't going to get TV, like the movies. So you were going to get as much uh, of those audience. Okay. Now that they're going with Picard, they're going to have a chance to get all the fans who were reluctant to, to jump on something new and want the old stuff. Many more of those Star Trek fans. And also, remember, Next Gen being over 25 years old now, that was more, way more of a broader cultural phenomenon than Star Trek ended up being in the late 90s and by the end of like Voyager. And so you have people who love Patrick Stewart and love the heyday of Star Trek. And I think there's a lot more opportunity for them to grow with this show. CBS All Access as a service. Same reason they did Twilight Zone. A lot of nostalgia there. Hmm. And I guess that does it for pop culture news. We got Android 10 launching on phones this week. It's out. Pixel phones got the day one update. I have sure. two Pixel phones, and I tried to get it last night. Couldn't get them on either, so I'm going to have to wait till today, I think. What candy is this? No candy. No candy this at all. No candy one? Should be sweet quiche. <laughs> should be sweet quiche. But that's it. Does It, it doesn't have a code name? No, it's going to be... They, they've changed the uh, whole thing. It's crazy. To Android 10. All right. So security, privacy, use just the, 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 uh, the iPhone 10 like swiping from the bottom, that the kind of... Uh, task bar, uh, gesture bar, sorry. Uh, that's all rolling out. Um, and A lot of the other stuff is like if they make changes to the hardware. Yeah. Because there's stuff on how uh, apps run in the foreground versus the background, but you know that's really not that big of a deal based on how I use the phone now. Mm. I have a Nexus 7, and it's stuck on 6. Mm. Can't get past there. Nexus 7, the tablet? Yeah, man. That was, a, that was a really good one. 2013. Yeah. That's my Android device. It's still kicking. Thank goodness you're not developing for Android. It's, that, it's got a candy code named version. <laughs> uh, on the iOS side, we have a little bit of a, a rumor, or I don't know if it's a leak, but uh, in the code for iOS 13, people mm -hmm. found allusions to AR headset support. Well, in a in a non-publicly released version of the code. Yeah, so the the, the code, the, the thing that was referenced is an app, a start tester app that can switch to a head-mounted mode and a starboard shell that could be for stereo AR apps. Yeah. 
Yep, we'll see. It, it doesn't mean that the headset's around the corner. It, yeah. This is code that they would need to build in there if they're using iOS as a code base for, uh, for, for headset for internal testing. How much would you like this to be one more thing next week? It's no way. Not, no way. No <laughs> way. I think we're at least a year away. Yeah, that would be something. I mean, we I start, think we're two years away, I honestly. Think, like, I, I don't even, this is not a news story. We know they're working on something. Well, it is only a news story in that they could cancel any time. And there well, are rumors suppo- that the weird thing is that they supposedly they, 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 they did, right? right? Like they put that team on hold. And this indicates maybe they're still working on it. I mean, they're still working on it. I, I think the hardware problems are probably tougher to solve here than the, the software problems. And they're not going to put anything out there until they feel confident in the hardware coming in at one, a price point that they're happy with manufacturing and yeah. then selling it upsell or a big markup. Uh, and two, the, a form factor that is socially acceptable, whether that's miniaturization of the hardware or other technologies making wearables become more more in vogue. I am not excited for them to release... Uh, that's the wrong way to say it. I'm not anxious for them to release this hardware anytime soon because whenever, whenever they decide to do, it's got to be good enough to entice the public to make a breakthrough in the same way that the iPhone was generations ahead of the competition and made a splash and became the, the device that all of their cell phones b- wanted to be. Like, I hope that they can do that for AR, but I don't want them to do it until it's ready. And in there, even when you think about the an iPhone and for an iPad, the thing that made it was the marriage of their software and a capacity of screens as opposed to resistive touchscreens, yeah. and was, which wasn't groundbreaking. People could make and buy capacitive touchscreens at the time, but they had found, you know, along with the flash memory stuff, they had found economies of scale that would let them manufacture this. Uh, so I don't think whenever they come out with the, the AR glasses, you know, we heard the John Carmack interview with uh, I haven't watched the Rogan podcast where he talked about AR and how, you know, the form factor is really the big thing. What's the use case? One wants to kill a rat, but also two, you know, is it going to be something that people are going to wear out in the field? Yeah. Uh, and... Right now, the, the Quest is not something you could, even with pass-through AR, it's something you could wear comfortably or socially acceptable out in the open, uh, but maybe something that's more like ski goggles. And if you look at some of those early renders, ski goggles may be something that kind of wraps around your entire face as opposed to glasses. We all want glasses, but ski goggles may be the next step. And I don't think Apple would be happy with yeah. ski goggles. I don't know. I mean, whatever it is, I, I'm fine if it's not what I expect it to be. Like, at the time that the iPhone was released, everybody had physical keyboards. Mm-hmm. And everybody thought they wanted one. And uh, Apple said no. And they've done the same thing with the floppy disk and sadly with the headphone jack. Like, they're famous for, like, going their own direction. So whatever that, if it is ski goggles, if they think, if they've tested that and that's what they believe in, uh, you know, great, I'm all in. But you know, wh- I'm open-minded. And I also, I also don't think it's going to be... Like one company is going to come out with a revolutionary breakthrough hardware technology that's going to be the thing that makes it a system seller. It's yeah. not like Apple, Facebook, or Magic Leap have the dis- one display manufacturer, one one type of display that no one else can manufacture. It, I feel like it's going to be... You don't think it will be that? I don't think it will be that. Why not? I mean, it could. I, I think... I mean, we want it to be that. I just, my gut says, I don't think it, it will be that. My, my problem is that currently, like if Magic Leap is the best possible, you know, AR tech, yeah. and that costs thousands of dollars. I mean, if, if Apple could do that at, at, you know, at scale and make it cost a third the price, mm-hmm. it's still not compelling enough to entice the mass market. So what is that technology that will? Like something, something It's got to be something new. Right, but is it something new that's going to be exclusive that no other company right. can make? Mm-hmm. Or is it is there going to be a breakthrough in display tech from a third party that no company is going to be able to buy up, or maybe one company does buy up, yeah. that then all of them have access to this type of technology, but the implementation of the technology and the marriage of the software and you know, the SLAM and, and, and the integration is going to be the thing that sells the hardware. My question also is, can AR be successful if it's designed not for outside use initially, if it's designed just for home use. Oh, dear. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's a more reasonable way to design AR. I, I, why? I just don't see Apple doing that. You think they would want something? That's, if they put out something, it's got to be something people will want to wear or they expect people to wear in the open, in public, not just in their homes. Because we expect it to be tied to their phone in some way, right? But it, you don't think there can be content 
and a use case is compelling enough that people would spend, let's say, $1,000 on a headset that you 95% of the time designed to be used indoors, in home. You mean it's like a computer replacement? Computing for mm. social interaction in home, bringing the virtual world to you. But that's a much simpler problem to solve in terms of recognizing the world and placing objects in the world than in an outdoor Yeah, and maybe even power. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Apple don't know. only has one, two products that stay in your house. The <laughs> Apple TV and like an a iMac. desktop. Yeah, an iMac slash Mac Pro. Everything else is out in the open. But if the use case is compelling enough. HomePod. Not HomePod. <laughs> not, not Even that's designed to be mobile to a certain extent. Does that have a battery in it? No, no, no. You got to put it okay. in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Moving on from actually, let's continue with some Apple news. Uh, two other pieces of Apple news, not related to new hardware, but to what happens to the hardware you've already bought. First of all, on Apple Watch uh, Series Two and Three, aluminum models. There seems to be a, uh, a defect some users have that the screen cracks, <gasps> and now Apple is allowing, uh, even if you're out of warranty, to get your screens and your watches replaced. Are, are, you, are you in that club? I'm not because I have the steel. I don't have the aluminum gotcha. one. But I am in on Gen it 2. Didn't, it didn't say why. I was very curious if it has something to do with like metal fatigue or just expansion and contraction of the metal with heat. But the, all he said was very rare. <laughs> well, in the Gen Zeros, uh, there was a problem with the batteries expanding. Mm-hmm. And that would push the screen off. That happened to my wife's. We had it replaced. Well, that, that's a feature. Pop off screen. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Bigger news, though, is Apple made the announcement that they're going to allow third-party repairers this to is... get certified and repair uh, iPhones, essentially. This is great. I Like, I'm a right-to-repair person, and this isn't quite that. Mm-hmm. But at least it's something along that way. I mean, it's it's a ridiculous bottleneck for Apple to uh, control all repairs uh, of their devices. It also uh, monopolizes and keeps the price for that for those repairs artificially high. And now we're talking about thousand dollar devices. Give me a break. So will Apple Care cover the new certified repairers? I it's a good question. I believe that is the case. It's going to be a free uh, certification process where you just need to apply. And this is where it's not exactly right to repair because Apple can deny and can kind of blacklist certain companies from mm. participating in this program. Um, and those companies need to have the Apple certified technicians who go through their own certification process. But what it allows them to do is get genuine Apple parts, which is better user experience overall, um, and get documentation and training and tools uh, and diagnostic tools as well. That's interesting. So there's just I, I think see that's a that feels like a win there because until I see a situation where a bunch of people blacklisted like this is how these programs start and uh, Kyle from iFixit was was pretty over the moon about this move. Well, especially since Apple yeah. talked uh, in in uh, testified to the fact that this is documentation that they didn't want out to the public because they was af- they were afraid that it would then open up the phones to being hacked and uh, and, and uh, bad overall user experience. But I think that one, they just can't support the, re- the number of people who need repairs in Apple stores. It's that experience has not been good for people, long lines and turnaround times, uh, and for people who do go to third party uh, repair shops, and there are so many of these that pop up, the experience that they've had has been at best mix because there are certain things that it's real they're not being black markety. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It may work one day and then, you know, and it also voids your warranty. You can't then take the phone to an Apple store and, and get other problems fixed. So this is all a good thing. I don't know when that certification process will kick off because I am going to look for a third party certified store to repair my phone as opposed to getting a new one when it gets announced in one week. Well, let's wait. <laughs> we'll wait. <laughs> We'll Let's see. see you, yeah, we'll see you the, in a week. I'm, I'm making the statement now. We'll see how good that camera that's, is. That's the other big news. Apple sent out a digital invite to their September 10th event. Mm-hmm. Mine must have gotten lost in the digital mail. Now you can, you can download. <laughs> it was a uh, the invite is a kind of a new take on the old Apple multicolor logo. Mm-hmm. So which leads to speculation that these may be new colors for some line of products. The expectation, of course, is new iPhones with 
everyone expects three cameras in the back, the removal of uh, the, the uh, uh, 3D touch on the front of the screens that then makes it cheaper for Apple to make. But pretty much the same ID, same body design. That's why I think next year is probably the bigger year for iPhones. Everyone expects a new body design next year along with 5G. Look, that would be the first time that happens. It's never been on the third year. I think it's, I mean, technically it would be uh, not the exact same body design because yeah, when's the, the last back would be three camera module as opposed to two camera When's module. the last time the iMac was redesigned? I mean, it's like they've found the design and now going forward, it's just internals. And so software. you don't think next year they're going to do a, a body redesign? I wouldn't all? count on it. I, I mean, really? I, would, no, I wouldn't. I, I mean, I'm happy with this. I wouldn't. I think every year something's just good enough to entice the hardcore. And if wow. it's been several years, then it's, you know, then you upgrade. So camera. Camera this year, 5G next year. I don't know, man. It's weird because the cameras do say the S year. I mean, it's definitely not 5G this but, year. Yes, no, no. but you're, you're right. It will be 5G next year. But I, like, will that be enough? There must be more Maybe than 5G. Maybe to cater to 5G and the antennas required there, it requires a new ID, a new design, physical design. Do you need a new ID? I think that's a big selling point for people. Yeah. A really big selling point. And also, we're talking about the shrinking, hopefully the shrinking of the front-facing mm -hmm. notch sensor, right? When they, when they can miniaturize that even oh, more. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess Right? So. And, yeah. and then that would be a, a big change as well. Yeah. So uh, that's going to hopefully be announced next week along with, I think, an expectation and also a new MacBook Pro, 16-inch MacBook Pro, uh, maybe a new Apple Watch. Who knows? They're kind of on an annual cadence for that. Uh, I'm making my statement now. I'm mm -hmm. not buying not buying the new iPhone this year. Going to save myself $1,000. Going to go repair, get the screen repaired by a certified technician instead. I'm skeptical. <laughs> Fight I'm, the power. I actually want to hear a lot more about some of the um, TV lineup that's coming because oh. I'm super skeptical did of you, it. Did you watch that whole special? Because they had yeah. a whole TV um, event. Yeah, yeah. No, I watched it and... Now, like, they haven't put it on sale yet, but it's two months away, right? Yeah. Aren't they going to roll out more now? I don't know. Gail's going to go up there with Oprah now? I don't know. Yeah, they, I'm, I'm curious. If they don't talk about it, it just tells you that they're not as excited about it as they should be. Oh, the, you know they're excited about it. I just wonder, how are they going <laughs> to... There's so much fodder that Disney has, like to f like to fill in. Like they have the Mandalorian, but they also have every Disney show that's ever been on, like the Wonderful World of that's, Disney. Like that's what is why it? Apple has to come out and stem the tide? What does Apple have? Yeah, that's what I do wonder. What that I don't is. think Apple can spend enough money to buy the excitement that Disney have in both the Star Wars brand and the Marvel brands. There's no amount of and and, and, and you know and Pixar. Right. Apple don't give up. Apple's they, no, they, come they out won't. Swinging. They won't. They won't. They didn't give up with Apple Music. Uh, but music, no one had that kind of exclusivity. You know, Tidal had some exclusivity. Uh, it was more about user experience. And so Apple has integration, but at that point, it, uh, Apple has bundles, right? Apple has potential to right. do an all, a bundle that gives you, you know, extra iCloud storage, TV. You know, they can do the Amazon Prime way to, to, to kind of, to um, the Trojan horse their video streaming service into your monthly bill. I think that's the only way they can have to win. Because uh, if you had to choose right now, if you if I said no choice, kill, kill you are allowed. It's, it's it's murder death kill or yeah. it's it's a it's a FMK, FM, FMK mm -hmm. for your uh, your your streaming services. So we get FMK on our streaming services. Yeah. Oh, um, I think this is easy. I think you got to still f Netflix. It's still the Whoa. It's still the leader. It gives you the highest of highs, the lowest of lows. That's f. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna. You're gonna marry Disney Plus without I'm gonna sight marry, unseen. Sight unseen, what? marry. You already have. Come, last I heard. Stay with the <laughs> you, one. You spent the money. Oh, your I did. Oh, I'm in. Marry the one that brought you, man. Like Disney's been with me since I'm a kid. Kill, kill Hulu. Kill uh, <laughs> Amazon Prime. It's, it's got to be Apple. Uh, oh, kill Apple. Yeah, everything yeah. else basically. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing. Yeah, Disney Plus is so strong. People are committing to three year memberships. Well, you did sight unseen. I tried to and I couldn't sign up. What? Well, well I, I wasn't. I didn't realize there was a free tier of the D twenty three. So yeah. then I went back and I did that, but I, I never got the invite. Man, uh -oh. I, I got to check again. Okay. Do you think that this whole scenario with Disney and Apple launching their own media services this fall would happen if Steve Jobs were still alive? No. <laughs> yes. He, you know, the, such tight relationships with with Disney, 
CEO of Apple. Like, I wonder. I think there would have been an acquisition. I yeah. wonder if I think that I think that's more likely the case. He would have bought Netflix, or there would have been some type of Disney or an merger ex- or something. I wonder if there would be like an exclusivity deal. The big difference between what happened with iTunes and what's happening with video now is all the companies have wised up. You know, everyone has taken the lessons that of what Apple did to really kind of bully the content owners into being on the platforms mm. and giving very favorable terms because the power of the platforms, now everyone's, you know, there's enough engineering out there, enough money out there that everyone's creating their own platforms. And Apple's old strategy of not being necessarily first to market, but being best to market may not work in this case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is fine. That's, that's how business works. And I'm well, happy for the, con- the content to exist and for us to have options. Yeah, and certainly this is not something that's going to make or break Apple. Yeah, uh, yeah. They can still get you on those iCloud. They can get you on the. They can get you on the, the RAM, uh, the the storage upgrades on the, the 128 gig storage. It's their new hobby. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the PC side, uh, there was a big update on Steam that was just announced today. Uh, oh, really? Steam. You guys use Steam? Yeah. I've heard of this service. No, it, it's I love Steam. So you realize that Steam, the Steam interface, the library interface, the place you go to one discover games yeah. and go launch your games and find updates for your games, yeah. that hasn't been updated in like a fifteen years. Well, th- there is the big screen mode. <laughs> yes, there's big screen mode, and and that big screen has been adapted to also a VR, which is like a, a console interface. It transforms your PC into yeah. a console interface. That's not getting updated. No. Gotcha. We're talking about the PC. Side, yeah, and so uh, they tease us at GDC, and uh, but now it's uh, it can be an open beta, I believe, September 11th, uh, 17th. Sorry, September 17th is when you'll be able to sign up and try out the new Steam library that tab that says store library community, yeah, library. Mm-hmm. You still have the list of games on your left side, yeah, but the right side where you can kind of discover the games and sort and kind of organize the stuff you have and what your friends are playing that's all gonna be visually. Different. You can kind okay. of create groups, drag and drop, hmm. pull left and right, um, and so I, I think it's it's long time coming. But Steam's kind of at this place where all these optimizations are solving problems that they kind of built into themselves. Right. One by having this massive user base. The problem is that they want these users to be playing more games than just PUBG, more games than just uh, Minecraft. And they wanted them to play more games. So all these updates feel like a way to get people to play different things, to tap hmm. into the trends. that Because the way games get popular on Steam is one, through sales, and two, that big Twitch streamers or YouTubers then jump on these indie games, and then people latch on, and then they, they skyrocket the really? sales. Huh. And they want that discoverability to be there. Yeah. And two, the other problem is that there are so many games. There are you know, hundreds, thousands. Well, of, they opened the floodgates years ago to right? just about anybody who wants to publish on Steam. And so to kind of be able to, to get that funnel to you to find the content you want, it's the Netflix, you know, the, 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 uh, the Netflix algorithm problem. It's yeah. how do you get people the to same find with the games. Yeah, same thing. And, and same, same with the, the App Store, right? And people are on their desktop. And the question is, are people still using that Steam window interface? Mm-hmm. And still, do you have that like a browser window as something you interact with on a regular basis? Or is it just literally the launcher that you go to launch your favorites tab and your you know your five favorite games that you play? I, my favorite part is just browsing the new releases. And so the, unfortunately, they kind of bury that. You have to so you do, you you actually do browse new releases. Definitely. And you look. I mean, they did the Steam Labs thing where they uh, algorithmically generate the micro trailers, six second trailers for you to get the screenshot or the like, little video snippets for yeah. every game. So you add a glance. I like that visual style. Let me try that. Mm-hmm. But I do think there's a lot of power in what people's friends are playing mm-hmm. and the kind of trends that you see like, oh, I'd never learned about this game, but like 30% of my friends are playing it now. I better... I, I should try it. That's important. I should yeah. b- download it and buy it and, and try it. Uh, the thing that I think is largely missing from this update is better kind of tying on the mobile side to to streamers because the mobile app I don't think is, is mm. updated as well. I think they're they're working mm. on that. But people watching Twitch streams, people watching YouTube videos of other people playing kind of novelty games and indie games, there should be a way to tap into that and say buy that game, add it to my Steam library, so when I get home, I'm playing that. How much of this do you think is a response to the Epic Game Store? 
Or is this coincidence? I think it's coincidence. I think it's more them wrangling and reconciling with the scale that they've grown to so far. And that any little change that mm. they make to this library has rippling effects for their entire user base because it can't be that different. Yep. Because if it's too different, the people are like, I don't like this. Yeah. I, I find it's more troublesome to get into my game. Maybe like, I won't use Steam. It's like MySpace anymore. or Dig.com. Yeah. Yeah. So visually, it's still that same kind of rectangular browser window, Steam library tab, list of games on the left, some big window on the right. Um, but they've kind of made it a little more visually friendly and and. See, as, as much as I rely on Steam, and I, I don't even have an Epic Games account, um, I still feel that they have become complacent. Over, I don't know what they make. They are a private company. Nobody knows what they make. But I have a feeling it's a lot of money. And they are probably perfectly comfortable with the status quo. And they have not had to release games. They haven't had to change Steam. <laughs> they just rake it in. Yeah. And so I wonder if this isn't maybe... Like they do see Epic buying up these exclusives and some of the audience going over there and them trying to refresh their image and maybe put some more effort back into it. Plus they have this whole non-hierarchical uh, you know, employment structure where everyone can sort of work on whatever they want and may, there's no top-down directives on you, this has to get done. Or right. Who knows? It's not across the board. They need 5% increase in usage time in Steam. Yeah. And also it's, it's, it, we're talking about a UI interface that while they, there's content there, right? You have like direct feeds from developers on the updates and events that developers can create and get people excited. You know, as much as they kind of tune this and, and, and make it visually interesting, the goal is still not to have people be in that menu. The goal is to get people in games. Just like Netflix menu is not to get people, like you don't browse through the Netflix menu to learn about the behind the scenes or to go through like Amazon does with like the actors and you know the actor the the IMDB stuff you go through the Netflix menu to get content you want mm -hmm. and then get in that content yeah and so I think they would want to make that as but that's all instantly available and free once you've paid your mission Steam is loaded with everything as a la carte mm -hmm. it's a different yeah yeah yeah, and then they want to get people not just playing, again, the five games they, they like, right. and the five games that they think they like. They want people to experiment with and buy and support indie developers. Yeah. So that's uh, being rolled out. Again, it's uh, September 17th, Steam Library Beta. I bet you can just opt in just through the Steam uh, Steam interface. I'm a little disappointed. There's no big screen, uh, big, uh, sorry, not big screen, a big picture mode update and a VR interface update. I feel like that could use... A little bit of an update as on the mobile side, uh, too. Uh, moving on, uh, what's next on our technical tech section? Hey, USB. Oh, I love USB. USB four getting sort of uh, getting uh, standard certified and ratified, and uh, the USB implementers forum has finalized the USB four spec, and so we may start seeing USB four support. As early as next year, I'm sure it's CES. <laughs> so it's supposed to be twice as fast, twice the bandwidth of uh, USB 3.2, which I don't even think any of my computers have. Right. That's the problem, <laughs> isn't it? Because it could be expensive for cable support, for port support for motherboards, manufacturers to get the stuff built in. If, if Intel chipsets and AMD chipsets don't have it built in, then it's going to become third-party add-ons for the for the time being, which means form factors won't be as great and uh, price will be higher. But the promise is dual lane, 40 gigabits per second speed, which yeah. matches Thunderbolt 3, and it will be port compatible with old USB. C. So USB-C, USB -C. C, exactly. So if you have USB-C cables that are just 3.2 or 3, then it'll still work. You just get the slower speed. Same number of conductors? That, I think, is the case. Okay. Yeah. And so that means it probably handles display as well as power. Though. Yes, yes. The idea is it will hopefully see USB-C as m more of a high bandwidth display port. Um, none of this matters, even if we were starting to see these products and test it at you know IDF and at, at, uh, at CES. It's not going to matter until Intel like puts it on a laptop. It and will native all... USB-C, USB 4C cables in the laptop. It'll also be spec backwards compatible with all the other USBs. So if you have a dongle, you could still plug in any old device. Right. So that's good. Right. That was an important part of it. I don't know yeah. if power draw, if you can get more voltage uh, out of this. Right. I wonder. I mean, yeah. C is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's enough. 
or yeah. because you can run displays off of that, power displays off of that. Uh, also, um, Charge external, devices. external GPUs yeah. would be a big thing for this as well. Uh, on the Windows side, Microsoft has uh, announced and unveiled uh, some more details about their new tablet experience. Now, this is for two-in-one devices. And you know, right now, if you have like a Surface two-in-one device, you have the desktop mode. But once you remove the keyboard, then it goes into kind of a tablet mode, which is kind of not a not great desktop mode. Like uh, you have the virtual keyboard, but some of the, the taskbar stuff just doesn't look... It, it, it's not as touch-friendly. And so now there's going to be the better spacing on the taskbar, easier access to the virtual keyboard, and things where if you're holding a tablet with two hands, easy access for your thumbs. Does it auto-enable when you separate yeah, the keyboard? Yeah, as, as I do today. So it's just a, a stylistic difference. Um, the tablet mode is still going to be there, but it'll be changes that will be automatically enabled on like a Surface Pro. So that's good for tablet users uh, and convertible users. Uh, um... Last bits of technology news. Uh, Facebook's using an AI assistant and training it in Minecraft? What's going on here? Did we read this story? I think he's talking to you, buddy. Did I do this? <laughs> no way. One of us put way. the story in. There is no way I put this in here. All right. We're not going to talk about it then. <laughs> I might have put this that's, on here. That's your homework, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look into that one. Sometimes I just like browse through <laughs> stories. Like, oh, this would be an interesting story to read. And I put it in our show notes as a, a bookmark. Yeah. And then I don't get to it. Yeah. I've never even played Minecraft. Should I play Minecraft? Really? Is it uh, any good? Really? Yeah, you should absolutely yeah. try Minecraft. You and you and your son should absolutely play Minecraft together. Hey, uh, the um, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration is starting to examine tests for allowing... Uh, rear or side mirrors to be replaced by cameras. Yeah, I don't know about this. So, so remember Tesla had, had promised this on a Model X a long time ago and then they kind of backed away from it. I don't think it's a good idea either. No, and do and you remember the Audi e-tron yeah. uh, unveiled with these? I mean, not for sale, just at like a car show. Right. And I remember one of the reviews was like, yeah, one of the cameras looked good, but the other one is in this position where... Which was not natural. Well, there's a couple and things. And so, even if it worked perfectly, it still requires some some sort of uh, like relearning, and then it's not going to work perfectly. No, it's not. Uh, the, the benefits. Of, let's go with the benefits first. Lower, smaller profile, right? You can have a r yeah, wide camera have. view. You potentially get some night vision capabilities of the camera, so the cars become more aerodynamic with the camera, the side mirror not protruding so much. See, blah, it, blah, 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 that's blah, blah. not going to make much difference. The aerodynamic, but the downside and the challenges of implementing that you can't see out your mirrors, side mirrors. Well, is wherever you put the display that display has to be as good as light cut bouncing off a mirror and not just talking about the resolution or the readability in daylight and in bright sunlight but also the parallax you don't get parallax you're talking about what i talked about in the display in the bolt video yeah you need eye tracking i have a rear view mirror in my Chevy Bolt that uh, you can flip into a mode and it becomes a display. And it is a full screen display. It's actually technically very cool. It shows what the, ca what the camera, camera sees, sees in the rear of the car. And if you have your trunk loaded up so you can't see out the hatchback at the rear window with the rear view mirror, it's better than nothing. But the problem that Norm just said is huge, where if you look normally in a rear view mirror, you don't have to change your, fo your focus. Like you're still focused at infinity at like the car in front of you is pretty much probably the same as the car behind you or close enough. But focusing on a plane that's just a foot and a half away from your face takes a moment or two away from your attention on the road. And that's bad news. And that's just the, the, the focus, the optimum focus, but shifting your head left yeah. and right. Yeah. It's the camera doesn't shift. No. So you need eye tracking to actually change the display as you move your head left and right. Because that's how when you glance over to your side mirrors, you're also kind of looking around as well, unless you're getting a full, like, you know, full wide uh, like a fisheye field of view and, and, and everything. I, I would say in defense of this idea, it does open up the possibility of a better field of view. Yeah. Like the problem with side mirrors is like, I don't know what, why they can't design better ones. Well, that's why they, they have those attachments. That you, you, can side get mirrors, a, you can that, get those. That is the fisheye. Aftermarket. Right. But like everybody has a, has a blind spot, even if it's perfectly calibrated. And most people don't even know how to calibrate their side mirrors to begin with. Yeah. They think they're side rear view mirrors and they're not. They're supposed to be blind spot mirrors. They're 100% blind spot mirrors. Just look, you want to see the side of your car. That's, that's the thing that annoys me, by the way. 
Uh oh, yeah, we're no. bringing it back. <laughs> no, no, no. I was gonna play it, but oh, I'm not gonna, no, I'm yes, not gonna play it. I'm not gonna play it. No, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Things that annoy me. People don't know how to adjust their side mirrors, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> Been fighting this battle long and hard. How are you supposed to adjust fight side mirrors? All right, so you look, you're standing, you're sitting there in your car and you see out the rearview mirror. As soon as a car, you don't want to move your head like forward and backwards, you're sitting comfortably. When a car leaves your rearview mirrors coming up beside you, it should enter your side view mirror. You want to adjust it so that as it leaves and you see like only half of that car in the rear view, you see half the car in the side view. And then you want to calibrate it so that when it leaves the side view, it enters your peripheral vision. That's what you want to do. But most people don't adjust their side view mirrors while they're driving. They do it when they start up their car and there's no car behind you. You got to. The only way to do it is while you're driving. As soon as you get behind a new car, you just got to spend that first bit on the highway. That's why you got to turn autopilot on <laughs> and then spend some time adjusting the side mirrors. I, and also you should just look to the display that tells you virtually there's a digital car because of the radar that, that, that pops out the autopilot cameras that tells you a car has pulled up to the side of you and it's blinking red. Yeah, that's and, handy. And how do you know people don't adjust their side mirrors? Because most people that I know, I, um, they, they have their mirrors adjusted so that they can see behind them. You know, And the only time that that's good is the, the case that I mentioned a moment ago. If you're moving and you have your, your trunk all packed up, your hatchback all packed up so you can't see out the rear view mirror, then, yeah, you want to be able to see behind I will it. give you one other case. It's the biker's on the side of the bike lane where you sometimes need to not just see in your blind spot, but just see straight behind you. Yeah, no, it goes without saying, even if you have your mirrors calibrated, always check your blind spot manually. Give a little look around. Make sure that you're clear there. That's it. Jeremy has a lot of parking and driving label (laughs) and label situations on things that annoy him. I hadn't thought about that. Mm. Uh, Speaking of cars and Tesla, Tesla announced a new internal um, insurance policy that you can buy from Tesla directly if you are a California resident. And their promise was that the uh, the price and the premiums would be cheaper than going with a third party. I think some people found that it's either you know very similar in price or even higher on the Tesla side in some cases, but they think their insurance offering is you know 20-30% cheaper than with conventional products. Why would a car company do this? I don't get it. Like are you going to make that much money on insurance or is it just a convenience factor for people buying the car. I think it's a convenience in, in brand and, and kind of like it's all in the family. I don't think it's a giant money Do they get to con- control where repairs happen a little bit that more with maybe, their insurance? That's, yep, maybe that's part of it as well. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, the concern was, though, that your premiums might change based on telemetry data from your car. So Tesla knows how you drive, whether your eyes on the road, but it, it sounds like none that of sounds that- super illegal. Yeah, none of that is going to be used <laughs> for, for this insurance. I always thought it was a good idea for an insurance company to, to start up, a, but require you use a dash cam footage, and then you know you, if you get viral footage, then they own it, and that would help oh, so they, your premium. They get the YouTube ad they, revenue they get, from they, the viral. <laughs> exactly, they get they own all your footage from your dash cam, and and the data from that, but your premiums would be lower. I'm waiting for a car just to have a dash cam built in. Like front why facing. doesn't yeah, front the Tesla kind of do that? It. It does, it does. And then you can do sentry mode. Can you, you, you can record? actually you can hit a button. You can it'll it'll continuously record and you hit a button and it, then it'll save like the last X number of seconds uh, from those cameras onto a while you're camera. driving? While or? you're driving. Oh, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. It, it's people have posted lots of interesting videos, to say the least, of, of things I've seen on the road that they can then react to and click. But otherwise it's a big power hog too. A lot of people don't want to, <laughs> really? to have like, the sentry mode actually kills your, your car battery life. What? Yeah. Does it, it, on. Does it, it must run it, off the 12 volt battery. No, it runs off the, the main battery. But what? the problem is that when you're in park mode and the sentry mode is on, and so it activates and starts recording footage when people get too close or activate the proximity sensors, yeah. it doesn't allow the car then to go in a natural low power hibernation mode. It's always kind of bracing itself and at the ready. Hmm. And so that is a, that's the vampire train. Vampire. Vampire drain. Uh, last bit of tech news, and it is Tesla news again. They had a minor uh, outage on their app. Were you bitten by this? I, I wasn't. So this is a, <laughs> it's kind of a silly thing, right? Like 
People were complaining on social media that because of this three-hour outage, they were unable to get into their cars. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say Tesla also gives you two RFID cards. You should have one of those on you at all times, mm -hmm. right? Use your key. They also sell the key fobs that you can use to unlock your car. Don't rely on the app. This is why we can't have nice things. But I also sympathize with the people who rely on the app because I know, for example, my parents rely on the app. They like the convenience. They like the idea that it just works, Bluetooth, you go up to the car. And technically, like, you don't need an internet connection. The app is, yeah, uh, it, it, it's Bluetooth enabled, right? So, so, so why was this a problem? I, I think it was a problem was because if it is, when you are in good internet, sometimes the app wants to update mm -hmm. and sometimes it'll maybe kick you out the login screen and you'll need to log in again. And if you're not logged in, if you're not in a place where you're just perfectly authorized, and the service is down, uh, then you are stuck. Gotcha. So it's a sm small case. It is kind of the new world we live in. It is an easy thing to joke about. I think people sh shouldn't rely on just their phones to be their keys for everything. You should always have your backups. It's not difficult to have that credit card key in your wallet. What has he done with Norm? Like not relying on your phone? This is crazy. <laughs> well, my phone's broken, right? I got the screen cracked. Ah, so, I can't so there you go. Do you carry anything. your uh, RFID key 100%. around? 100%. Well, there you go. Because so. it's also what you give to you know valets for parking. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And you That's get two true. of them for free. Yeah. Guess you don't give them your phone. No, you don't give them your phone. <laughs> no. You don't leave your phone in the car either because it's someone some can drive away. <laughs> I just love the idea of being handing a valet. Here's your my phone. phone. <laughs> Here's the unlock code. Take good care of it. Here, let me add you to my face well. ID. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. Come get me if there's any em emergency messages. Yeah. All right. Do we need to pause here? Or no, we don't. We're let's good. Go. All right. Now let's move right on. Now it's time for a moment of science. All right, I put up a map on the screen of the Earth, and gentlemen, what do you think that map is? There's Sat a bunch of dots. S satellites and, and uh, space debris. That is correct. Yes. That is a map of how many satellites are surrounding the Earth. There's roughly just under 2,000 based off of the latest data I've seen. That's it? Some of those are out of commission, and... Uh, some of them are obviously uh, classified and some of them are are well known. And one of the things that you have to manage, this obviously this image isn't to scale, is how do you manage and make sure there aren't collisions so you don't get a gravity situation where there's a collision that actually creates more collisions, it creates more problems. Chaos. Now, the likelihood of these collisions tends to be pretty low. And uh, there is a default number that is sort of uh, thrown out there. They're looking for a collision chance of less than 1 in 10,000 as the standard for when they have to make uh, maneuvers of satellites to uh, avoid that. Well, last week, mm -hmm. the ESA, which is the European Space Agency, had one of their satellites come up on alert that they had uh, a 1 in 1,000 and actually went below that at one point. Um, chance of hitting a Starlink satellite, which was recently put up by SpaceX. And so according to them, they were like, called up SpaceX and were like, yo, you should move. Uh, and we need to talk about this. This is 10 times below the threshold. How long was the time until the collision? I mean, it, it was it was weeks ahead, oh, okay, okay. ahead oh. of time. But they, were, they called them up and said, hey, we got to do this uh, maneuver. Uh, or somebody has to do the maneuver. And according to the ESA, the initial reports is that SpaceX did not respond to them and were not giving them information. Later on, SpaceX said that the initial conversation said uh, that the chance was in the 1 in 50K region, um, which is well above the, the 1 in 10K that they need. It's acceptable. Uh, but then there was additional updates. And those updates... SpaceX didn't get that information is what they claimed. From whom? From the uh, ESA or from, uh, from the satellite? I believe the, the um, um, uh, updates came f via the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> um, and so they're claiming they didn't get the updates properly. So the satellite was fine, but their literal computer system on the ground did not get the updated information. So they weren't about to execute uh, a maneuver. Uh, and it, it tended... It, it's, fine, they've made the, the change at this point. 
But the ESA is now looking at automating collision avoidance. Well, the ESA made the change. Yes. Like SpaceX still did nothing. And the ESA pushed their satellite to a higher altitude. Yeah. And there was a little bit of being like, SpaceX, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? I mean, I imagine these are expensive maneuvers because there's not in, um, you know, unlimited fuel on board to mm -hmm. make maneuvers. So they have to, you know way when they should make them. But out. also with this many satellites out there and that number just growing and growing and growing, having a manual system for this where literally like somebody not getting the proper update on the calculations that and is. relying on that might be a problem. And that's why the ESA, ESA is actually looking into automating I read that, automating that the satellite, that the SpaceX satellite is part of a networking satellite yes, system. And that's what Starlink is. They're planning to put 10,000 of these things in orbit. Which is deliver internet. To according to you, places. would be five times as many satellites as are up there now. Wow. I mean, that's going to require some serious traffic control. Yeah, satellite pollution. <laughs> Get that light pollution, satellite pollution. Yeah, yeah. Very good. No, that's very good. good. No, no, very good. No. Yep, yep. <laughs> I should be voted down for that. Um, all right. right. If you were, if they gave you a one in thousand chance that you were going to get hit by a bus going home today, would you go home? Yes. <sighs> one in a thousand, not one in a hundred. I Order know. of magnitudes. I'm kind of thinking the same thing. I don't know. But I, you know, I'm not a space guy. I don't know. I mean, it's expensive. I don't know what my baseline chance of getting hit by a bus is. I want to know that. <laughs> like, is my baseline chance of getting hit by a bus one in a thousand? You're saying, well, today it's one in a thousand. <laughs> is it one in fifteen hundred, and it's just going down to one in a thousand? I'm kind of fine with that. Yeah, what is it but if it's like one in a million, and you say today it's one in a thousand, mm -hmm. I have a problem with that. Okay. I have, and I have more problem with not just me, but with like at scale, everyone in San Francisco. I would, I, I would fear for us as a as a whole, if the risk for getting hit by a bus is one in a thousand. Oh, yeah. Then people are getting hit all the time. Yes. Yeah. So it can't be one in a thousand. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a good point, Norm. All right. Let's take a look at the Starhopper test. This actually happened about a week ago. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a ship that rises up. It launches up. It's a sort of weird looking ship. I have the video up on the screen for those who are watching. Uh, it flies about 100 to 150 meters in the air. And then it moves laterally. Is it moving laterally? Yet? It is no. moving laterally. No, no, it's going up right now. I mean, it looks like the, the screen. looks like the lunar it's, lander module. Yeah, it has kind of like a hover-esque feature. And then it there starts moving. There it goes. It's about to move laterally. And it moved laterally about, I don't know, 50, 100 meters, and then mm. set back down. So what is this craft? Uh, it's a, uh, what's it called? The Star, Star Hopper. Hopper. Yeah, what's it for? Uh, well, essentially, it it's going to help with capabilities kind of like the lunar lander is uh, and allow us to look at landing on moon and Mars in, in ways where they can actually move around on the surface. Hmm. I'm just trying to... Which will close. require a lot less uh, thrust than on Earth. Yes. Uh, and so it's really interesting. NASA has a very similar vehicle that they were uh, testing as well. Uh, but you wouldn't think that this would be that hard to do, but like maintaining that sort of altitude and then moving laterally is is um, uh, uh, quite a challenge. So uh, I think this project started in like 2013, I want to say, and they've been doing these tests in Texas. NASA had a similar test. I don't think there's video of it yet, but it was also uh, successful. Cool. So I think with some of the the shift towards some of these lunar landing programs, this could be really interesting, uh, but it's still a pretty long way off. All right, bad news, mm -hmm. and then we'll get to some weird science news. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was hanging out with Bill Duran at, at Dragon Con, Good guy. and he built a custom outfit, um, custom piece of armor, uh, and it had this like what he called an impact arm. It was like punchable. And it made smoke coming out of it. What? And if you watch the build video, he used essentially a vape pen that has like a, a vegetable glycerin uh, that has, you know, electrical feature and it vapes out. Sounds familiar to like a certain ghost trap. Yes. Very, very similar design to uh, Sean's ghost trap design. And it reminded me that there were some interesting stuff that came out on vaping this past week. So one is that there's currently 190 cases as of a couple days ago that have been reported to the CDC of people having a mysterious lung illness associated to vaping. At this point, they don't think it's a bacteria or a virus, but people are coming down with this condition. Mostly uh, a lot of the 
people who have come down to this have um, uh, been in Chicago, but they're having like some sort of respiratory ail- ailment indicating either there's a pollutant in the, um, in the vape, uh, what do you call it? Vape. Liquid. Oh, okay. Um, or there's something else happening. They're having like a reaction to the smoke. And so they don't know the, ca- the why this is happening. Is there a common denominator? Is everyone vaping the same fluid? Don't know yet All because right. there's a, a 190 cases. This is a mysterious ailment. At the same time, it came out that the FDA is investigating Juul, which is the leading probably like nicotine-based a vape manufacturer, and this is at a time when Juul is facing a number of um, uh, what do you call them referendums that are going to essentially ban the sale of uh, Juul products in towns. There's one coming up in San Francisco, um, and the reason is they are investigating because there are now links to lung disease mm-hmm. associated to use of Juul products, and the FDA is trying to get to the bottom of seizures that have developed in uh, over 100 people uh, over the past nine years uh, that's been associated to people smoking Juul and vaping generally. We don't know, again, we don't know the source of this. This is one of those things where the market outpaced the science pretty quickly because we went from like no vaping to everyone everyone in what, like two years, maybe three years. Now you're seeing those long-term studies start to catch up and starting to see some potential consequences of it. So these are all both really small, mysterious element for the CDC. This uh, seizure situation could be tied to a million things. It could just be some sort of tainted uh, liquid, could be something more systemic than that. I just think it was, uh, it hasn't been widely publicized, these problems, and I think they deserve more attention. And last one, I think I was listening to a still untitled a month ago, and Adam started talking about room temperature superconductors. Is that right? Yeah, I didn't make that up. That wasn't me dreaming still in title. I'm pretty sure it happened. <laughs> um, and there was a, a paper that came out that theorized not a room temperature superconductor, mm-hmm. but a high temperature superconductor that can operate at 200 degrees Celsius. It is a hydrogen lithium magnesium compound that has been modeled in the lab, it's going to have to exist at two and a half times the pressure of the atmosphere on Earth. Oh, gosh. No problem. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm sorry. Two and a half million times the pressure of the atmosphere on the Earth. (laughs) That's like, wait, two and a half times isn't right. Uh, Two and a half million times of it. Uh, They're going to attempt to create this in the lab, but according to their theoretical model, this will superconduct at that high temperature and ridiculously high pressure. Okay. I think it's super interesting to look at how they're developing different materials that can superconduct so at n- normal temperatures because it will change the face of computing. So traditional superconductors have to operate at like close to absolute zero? Yeah. And th- or low it- temperature, not absolute zero. So which is, which is more difficult? Uh, what? the pre- Oh, the pressure is, <laughs> is way cr- crazier in this case. Uh, because it's theoretical. But if you get a room temperature superconductor, you change everything. Oh, then that's good. Yeah, but that's not what this is. No, well, this is a theoretical. All right, that's cool. That's hey, cool. there isn't like every day, there isn't like a new room temperature superconductor development. I'm just doing my best. <laughs> the VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. We're going to jump through these relatively quickly. The big story, it's actually a video they can find on Tested right now, is uh, the new game mode that got launched for Rec Room, hopefully by the time you're listening to this. If not, mm-hmm. then later today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's Stunt Runner. We saw a preview of this, a trailer last week, but we love Rec Room. It's the free social game for all the VR platforms as well as flat screen platforms. And uh, there's a new game mode that's basically Ninja Warrior, but in VR. So four players run through a series of six courses and you are running with your thumbstick, no teleport, but you're then also jumping, you're grappling, you're climbing, Mm -hmm. you're wall running, which is super fun, sliding by pressing a button uh, and navigating these pretty... Sliding? Yeah. So So you can... 
uh, on your right thumbstick, yeah. you can click that in and then you do a little bit of a fast slide. Oh, okay. But if you're down a ramp, yeah. then you, uh, you hit it, then you slide down that ramp really quickly. And does it like carry your momentum so that if you're moving and then you hit slide, you... You can jump. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you had a chance to play this. I played it through uh, at the rec room headquarters uh, on a near final build, uh, and I lost because everyone's really good there. There yeah. are also power-ups that you're running through these little soda cans that give you speed boost. Oh, okay. No offensive weapons, so it's not Mario Kart, so you're not throwing red shells or blue shells or anything like that, mm -hmm. and no like time penalties mm -hmm. like that you might see in a lot of these competition shows where if you touch an object, like then you... You know, get 10 seconds added to your time or anything. But how, you can fall into pits and then respawn. Um, how long does it take you to get through one of the levels? Like a minute and a half. Oh, okay. Oh, that's yeah. a good yeah. amount they're, of time. They're not, not they're relatively quick. You can get through the whole thing in like 15 minutes. How, <laughs> how intense is it compared to something like Sprint Vector, which is a pretty physically not intense? Not as physically intense because you're not doing the hand, uh, the, the locomotion movement with your hands. You're not swinging your hands back and forth, but you are doing a lot of grappling, so a lot of fast climbing. That's probably the most physically intense part. You are doing not physical jumping, but you are ducking under things. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it is pretty... Like, it, 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 if you're not, if you're prone to motion sickness, you may not be the most comfortable in this. Although there is a new comfort mode that basically, basically then you play it in like a TV screen. Oh, funny. Yeah. Are you saying that because of all the motion or? All the motion the, and turning the, that's required, all the verticality that's required, all the high bouncing. That's the, my question is all the new types of locomotion or yeah. life of moving through the world. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. The wall running stuff. Uh, so I would encourage maybe trying with vignetting turned on hmm. first. Uh, and Does it seem easy to learn hard to master? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Good. It's going to be very, very Good. hard to master. People are going to do speed runs all day long on this. But the bigger news is that there's going to be a collaborative level editor that's launching with this, I think, a week later. So you, the three of us, yeah. you know, we could all jump into Stunt Runner and then pull a door and enter a template room, and then we can actually then create maps. That other people can VR. play? That we can upload to the community, and then there's a leaderboard of like the most played maps, and so they want people to be creating these platformers. That's making, cool. Making Mario levels in VR. Mario Maker. Mario Maker, but VR. All that's right. exactly what they're aiming for. So that's Stunt Runner. Uh, and then uh, some news that came out of PAX, uh, Borderlands 2 for uh, PC VR uh, is coming out. Uh, this fall. Is this exciting? Yeah. I'm not a Borderlands player. Did you ever play Borderlands? No. This might be the time to get in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we should we should try it. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not always hooked by awesome PC game now in VR, you know, because like Skyrim uh, didn't didn't grab me. I know it's a lot of people's favorite game, but... Um, but people are enjoying the No Man's Sky port. Fallout 4. That's true. That's true. But they, they really went all in on converting that to VR. I wonder what it'll be like. Uh, I think the Borderlands, the grind aspect, I mean, there's so much content in there with the, the looting and the, the characters like, and the vast open world. Uh, but uh, the, the grind aspect, I think, was going to be hmm. interesting. I think it's not co-op, unfortunately. Hmm. I think it's just um, single player. Uh, so that's the, my other my, my my fear for it if it was co-op and you could do a board on so much fun was was in the co-op uh that would get me to play it yeah, if i can't play with you guys a yeah, little, little less like a little less interested uh bad news and good news bad news first from ubisoft space junkies development is done it's over no more new space junkies they're not going to do a flat screen version so the servers will still stay up but it's it's gonna it, it's I think it sold as many as it could, uh, built as big a community as it could. It's still gonna be on sale, but um, it's not gonna get new maps or new updates. So that's a little sad. But Ubisoft is building out a fifty person VR team in their Germany offices, the same team that did the Assassin's Creed um, uh, location based VR stuff. Yeah, and for undisclosed, which is good game. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a good location-based game. But the rumors are this is tied to Facebook's maybe exclusive deal that was rumored of them doing a flagship VR game yeah. uh, with an Ubi license, Assassin's Creed, or Splinter Cell is my mm -hmm. is what I'm hoping for. I'm really hoping for a Splinter Cell VR game. Yeah, that would lend itself well. That would be really cool. Uh, the Lab got an update from Valve, so not the flagship VR title that we're still waiting for. It did? Yeah, The Lab got a physics and uh, index finger-tracking update. 
Huh. So uh, not only did you get the index controller supported, fully supported with the finger tracking and the, the pressure gripping, but also the physics are better throughout. No new games, though. No new games. No new games. Yeah. Uh, and then, Kishore, at Dragon Con, you got to hear about The Void. Yeah, um, Tracy Hickman, who is like a famous fantasy writer, he wrote a lot of the Dragonlance uh, series, is the head of story at uh, The Void because his son Curtis is the the CEO. And he talked about, uh, I think it's called Nicodemus, if I'm pronouncing it right, the evanishment of some, uh, the demon of evanishment. Uh, it's a new original IP that is booking now in the Vegas Void. Uh, location. Uh, and he talked about their experience of, of trying to tell stories in VR and how it's so different from other narratives that you're seeing. It's their first horror-based one. I think they released a trailer in early August for it. Um, but it was really interesting here their approach to storytelling because they are really leaning in hard to like the multi-sensory experience to help tell stories. So there's going to be more smells. There's going to be more touching. There's going to be more like a sense of feeling in space. Like if you've done like the Star Wars one, you definitely feel heat at some points. Um, and uh, it was it, it was interesting how they're leaning into uh, this kind of like whole world story storytelling where uh, the players can do whatever they want uh, and that have be a basis for how they're driving um, these 15 minute experiences, hmm. which seem contrary uh, at points. Uh, but I'm really interested what this looks like in original IP now. So it's and more a horror based VR, is right? Right, exploratory. It's about yeah. it's, it's a little bit more of like a haunt, right? Yeah. But as opposed to spending a couple hours in a haunt, and you're still only 15 minutes. I do like that this is a set in Chicago's World Fair, which I'm a big fan of World's Fairs and the, the setting. So uh, that seems like a great venue for it. It is like you said in the Vegas one. I think Santa Monica Void has it, not San Francisco just yet. Uh, but I, I want to play this. I wish that the void could, I don't know, I wish that, that you could get some of that experience at home. You know, I wish that there was a, a heat fan that you could tap into or a rumble surface you could stand on. So I, I kind of don't. I'm starting to see the void more and more as a social experience that's masquerading as Fair. this like high tech kind of thing. Yeah. And I think there is something special about being in a room together and going through that. Together. You're absolutely right. And, and, Part of the what sells it so well is one-to-one -one physical locomotion, not any kind of artificial lo locomotion. But oh, I just wish that there was more of that haptic, you know, experience at home, right. you know? which would make. I mean, we talked about Tea for God last week and the kind of reality bending. Uh, uh, room scale where yeah. space isn't what it seems like because it's doing things with the physical space you have. That kind of game would not work in a shared. It'd work in multiplayer, <laughs> but it would not work in a shared, no. localized space no. because your you, buddy would be standing in a wall exactly, or something. Exactly, exactly. You'd all be occupying Although, different parts. Although, there's that one multiplayer thing that don't touch the red walls where everyone's in a different space. Right, but that's that's not in the same physical space. Everyone's in their that's own. True. That's multiplayer. No, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, multiplayer would, would 100% work for T for God. And that yeah, would actually yeah. work really well if we all had our own, you know, 15 feet by 15 feet rooms yeah. that we were doing a game like Tifa got in, and then we try to communicate, oh, I'm on the fourth plane of existence that you need to go through this door and this door and this door to unlock. Like that, that's, that would be a really fun uh, multiplayer experience. By the way, did you read about the, um, the shooter, you know, Half-Life potentially code that was found in the lab? I did. Yeah. Allusions I, to some type of Half-Life 3. Thing. I guess because it's made in Unity, somebody disassembled it and found some code in there that was, seems like uh, unused code for a VR you know, shooter experience that involved combines Combine, and things right, from the right. Half-Life universe. Right. Uh, so I'm, fingers crossed, I mean, if that's coming through the lab someday, fantastic, even if it's not a full-fledged game. Yeah, that's actually, I, that's where I would see that being more appropriate. You know, everyone's kind of wondering what the theme of this flagship Valve VR game is going to be, and I actually don't want it to be Half-Life 3. Yeah. I would rather it be in the Aperture world, because that's where they've had so much success and experience you know, with interactions, with character design in VR, that why not lean into that? Uh, or, or Left 4 Dead. That's my secret hope, Left 4 Dead. What, it would be Dota 2 if you were going on uh, popularity. Less, 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 less interesting for me. <laughs> uh, two VR games to recommend this week. Uh, Akron. Uh, this is a, a symmetrical VR experience 
where one person is wearing a VR headset that's playing Acron. a tree. Acron. It's Acorn, isn't it? A- Acron. Not Acorn. It's not. Type it out. Acron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I believe you. Battle of the Squirrels? A, yeah, I'm, I'm not okay. dyslexic, am I? Like, you're reading it right now. Right. Attack of the Squirrels, Acron. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, not you're Acorn. Right. I thought it was Acorn. Uh, and you are a tree, and you are attacking these squirrels, and the players, pl- an AI players, play the squirrels on their mobile devices. On a phone Have you played it? Yep. Yeah. I played it with my family. Yeah. I had three squirrels versus the tree. We it's, all took turns as the tree. And do you, which one do you, do you like playing more? Uh, I, either one. We, we actually had a really good time. Um, my my twelve year old son at one point squealed with joy. He said, "Oh my god, I just picked up mom!" Because <laughs> we didn't know you could do that at the time. As the tree, they yeah. reached down, grabbed her, and tossed her across the, the world. It was I good, think good we time. want to see more of these um, asymmetrical yeah. VR experiences, sure. especially since it's hard to to uh, cast what you what you see in VR on the quest side onto a shared experience, mm-hmm. unlike in PSVR. Uh, there's also Cloudlands Two. This is the mini golf game. Yep. And uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's now got full-fledged golf courses. Like 38 of them or something. Choose your club. And you don't have to wait for the other person to swing. You just get to the whole ASAP. Yeah. This is high on my list after last week. We so should, we should play, this. play We should We should all jump in and, and maybe not do a podcast in it, but just hang out in it for half an hour and go through like an 18-hole course. Yeah. We're going to have an 18-hole playlist. I am... Secretly, incredibly competitive at mini golf, so oh. just look out. You know, I was I found it really relaxing. I was waiting for video to export last night, and just jumping in, really, and just playing a three hole course, really? just like waiting for twenty minutes. Like, yeah, you know, I don't even need multiplayer. I just want to kind of play some putt putt. Right on. And that's what the quest is great for. No, no, putt putt's a serious sport. We gotta if we're gonna do this, we're gonna talk take it seriously. Alrighty, uh, that does it for us this week. I'll on be the in podcast. a things that annoy me segment next week. <laughs> we got a we got a jet. We have some winning for us outside the room. Uh, we have an outro this week. You can say who it is. It's Will. We're getting lunch with Will. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks like a new one called Moon Knight from Wohawk. Hi there. I didn't see you. Pass it. Night. Moon Knight. No one saw this coming. Moon Knight. Ooh. I'm actually really excited I about that. Well, what you it. can do with Mark Spector. Oh, Moon Knight is basically Batman, except he's truly psychotic. Moon Knight. He hallucinates and thinks that he's speaking to an Egyptian moon god. Okay. And how does that help the humanity? He basically is like a Batman-style super rich dude who fights crime. But he's like tripping the whole time. But he's tripping the whole time. An Egyptian moon god. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. She Hulk gonna be a lawyer in this? Yes. The way you do She Hulk is you gotta have a good shit for Walters. Performance cap. You know, they're not gonna paint someone green and, and do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think she'll be She Hulk yeah. the entire time. I don't think we've gotten that type of performance cap, real time rendering technology. You don't have to paint someone green and, and do that. That's it. Wonderful. Every week. Every week. Love them. See you next week.